Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where we do a fair and objective analysis of the church and its truth claims, its history, doctrine and policy. So I'm back with uh, my friend, fellow Irishman, theologian and scholar, Robert Boylan in the house. Hi Robert. Hi, I'm not just say theologian, also a huge fan of the Smashing Pumpkins for those who recognize the shirt, but yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so we've been um, sort of like doing like a series of discussions on Joe Smith's first vision. Uh, we looked at, uh, was Joe Smith a modalist? A few episodes ago in the last one, we had a look at did early church leaders and Joe Smith's family members believe that the first vision was the angel Moroni that appeared to him and, and not the father and the son. I thought if you haven't watched that one, go back and watch it. Um, I think we sort of answered the questions that a lot of the early church leaders, if you look at those quotes in isolation, uh, from like the Journal of Discourses and Sermons, then it seems that way, but then there's other quotes at other times where they seem to be aware. I'm teaching the Father and the Son, and they would have been aware of it because uh, the 1838 account was published in 1842 in, in the Times and Seasons, so they would have been aware. And most likely the quotes from Joe Smith's family members might have been conflations. Um, that was sort of like uh, sort of like the conclusion that we drew on that but go check out, out that one tonight's episode we're gonna be looking at can man see god because joseph smith in his first vision claimed to see uh god the father and jesus christ but uh some critics especially maybe christians might point to scriptures in the bible that say man can't see god ergo joseph smith didn't see god and he was lying and the church falls flat so we're gonna be diving into uh some of those passages and maybe look at other passages that support uh, the view that man can see God. Obviously, uh, we can't prove that Joseph Smith saw God, but it's more to provide a defense to those who say there's no way he could have seen God, uh, according to the Bible. So I think we're going to dive in. Robert's prepared some slides, and this should be a good discussion. Well, uh, thank again, thanks again, um, Stephen, for having me on your show. I do appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Anything you want to say to, to open up? Um, well, if you're the praying type, I have my interview with the U.S. Embassy in Dublin on the 4th of November. So um, oh, if that yes. goes through, uh, I'm finally returning to Utah so I can actually work at the HQ in uh, Holiday, Utah. So that'll be our fun. Good. Yeah, good luck with that. All, all the visa stuff it is. Yeah. It's a, it can be a bit of a nightmare, so yeah, best luck with that. Oh, and also on the issue of modalism, uh, my friend uh, Adam Stokes, who's actually, he, he belongs to a group in the Broad Mormon Restorationist Movement, so one of the Elijah Message churches, and if, you, um, if you're familiar with my podcast, he actually appeared on the episode giving an overview of that denomination. Uh, he's actually agreed to actually have a friendly debate dialogue with me on the issue of whether the Book of Mormon and early LDS sources teach modalism, because... He's a believer in the Book of Mormon in terms of historical document and inspired, unlike, say, Vogel at all, but he actually believes it's consistent with modalism. That group teaches modalism. Okay, that'll be he's also ABD in biblical, uh, He's also ABD in biblical studies, so, um, like me, he's a theology nerd who knows Greek and Hebrew, so, um, you know, I'm beyond the outlook for that ask, possible dialogue. How does he make sense of the first vision if he believes the Book of Mormon is historical and true, but he believes it teaches modalism? Uh, he believes that the uh, like the eighteen twenty five account is like um, only expanding upon one person, but the different modes of that one person and so forth. And um, I have an idea oh, like how he would approach it. Um, so, be, and, uh, of course, like in our lighter episode, he knows how I'll be approaching um, that uh, particular topic. So, it, and we're both educated in theology academically, so it will probably be like one of the uh, best discussion series. Um, awesome! Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. yeah. And also in January, I'm scheduled to have a debate on with a uh, Catholic apologist. Um, the thesis is the Immaculate Conception of Mary is apostolic in origin. Um, so, uh, beyond the look for that, it's scheduled for sometime in January of 2023 in Utah. Uh, it's going to be odd because the Irish guy is a Mormon and the Utah guy is a Catholic, and that's going to confuse the audience. But, you know, beyond the look for that, anyway. <laughs> that, that's, that's quite uh, the swap around. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully that will be the only source of confusion on that debate, so... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, yep, that's uh, good. you got a good things uh, coming up. Yep. Uh, that, that's exciting. And hope you enjoy in going to Utah. Didn't you say the Midnight Mormons want you on their show? So will you be joining them? Uh, uh, yeah, in, Kurt, uh, Kurt, yeah, I'll be joining them, hopefully, um, with Kwaku being nice and calm. You know, no conspiracy theories while I'm there. I don't want my name tainted too much. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. Awesome. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, can you see my uh, slides? Yeah. 
Okay, well, uh, today's discussion is whether or not can man see God, and the spoiler, of course, is yes. Uh, look at the 1830 uh, First Vision account, which is a historical event. Let's go home now. But uh, no, uh, joking aside, um, in terms of the outline, um, I will be focusing largely on the biblical texts referenced in a video by your good self, Just Smith's First Vision Part 8, Can Man See God, from June of this year. Uh, though, I have, though I have included references to some other uh, important biblical passages, too. And yeah, yeah. we'll put that, that video, I'll, I'll link it in the, the, yeah. the description as well. I kind of do like a short sort of overview of some of the scriptures uh, Christians would point to in the Bible that say man can't see God. I look at some that maybe sort of contradict this and say, well, people have seen God in the past. Then I show some that we sort of like the church's view on it, but this will be sort of expanding and building uh, on that. But that, that's a good sort of intro video um, if people are sort of new to this discussion, this topic. Yeah, uh, and also, as I make mention here, uh, let me just maximize this. With the exception of discussing uniquely LDS scriptures, such as section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, I will be using only non-LDS sources, like non-LDS scholars, commentators, theologians, and even some critics of Latter-day Saint theology. Um, now, I know Greek and Hebrew, so I can actually go through the text, and I'm pretty well informed about the issues, but at the same time, one will say, well, that's your bias, that's done in Kruger, or what, some kind of smokescreen like that. Mm -hmm. So what I will be doing here is like providing like non-LDS commentators, non-LDS scholarship on the relevant texts and issues to show that mainstream biblical scholarship does not actually believe that there's a contradiction necessarily. They might claim they come from contradictory sources, like a P source and E source, but when it comes to whether or not man can see God, largely the biblical text, with some qualification, does teach man can actually see God. It's not mission impossible. Okay. Right. I guess that makes it more credible as well, because they don't have uh, a bias as much as well. I suppose they're biblical scholars, but they wouldn't have... Yeah. Maybe you could argue the same bias that a member of the church and apologist would be... And many, and many of them would be like a confessionally like reformed or Catholic, so they would actually be largely Trinitarian or agnostic. I'm not going to quote any Latter day Saint except to define Latter day Saint theology. And of course, when it comes to say the Doctrine and Covenants, you only really have like Latter day Saint commentaries on it for the most part, but mm. uh, be that as me. I'm one of the few Latter day Saints that you've quoted in these slides. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first text, of course, is Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. Um, and he said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And that's the King James translation. You know, and a prima facie reading would say, like, well, there's no qualification. You can't see God's face. Ergo, you can never see God. Okay? Yeah. So, that, now, the JST, and I'm only using this to show, like, Joseph Smith's expansion and um, interaction with the text, trying to harmonize this with the other texts. And he said yeah. unto Moses, Thou cannot see my face at this time, lest mine anger is kindled against thee also, and I destroy thee and thy people. For there shall no man among them see me at this time and live. For they are exceedingly sinful, and no sinful man had any time, neither shall there be any time sinful man at any time they shall see my face and live so it's not you can't see my face ever but because of sinfulness you know there's this kind of veil but yeah. you can actually still still see god in some albeit diminished way you know so i'm, I'm, I'm only going to jst to show what joseph smith did to the text i'm not using this to end the debate yeah because if joseph smith um did see god as he as he claimed as he believed then it must be strange from you know reading this passage in the Bible that says no man could see God. And it's like wait a minute, but I saw God. Like yeah, and as you know, like here, like there are texts that you say God was seen by man without qualification, like Isaiah six. So you know what's going on? Is there a contradiction? Yes. Now let me let me start. Mm -hmm. Let me say this: I don't believe scripture, and I would include uniquely LDS scripture there to be free from any error or any inconsistency. So like if there's yeah. an inconsistency in the scriptures, you know, um, for me, I'm not a fundamentalist. I have a very conservative view of scripture, but I don't, I'm don't. i not a fundamentalist. You know, I accept evolution, I have no problem with the documentary hypothesis, although I lean towards the supplementary hypothesis. So I'm not kind of some kind of like anti-intellectual crazy person here. I just don't yeah. believe there's a contradiction here. So, Okay. Now, um, actually, mainstream biblical scholarship understands, even in Exodus and the Book of Deuteronomy and other texts, you know, the Torah, God does have a form, and man can see some aspect of that form, but never God's full presence because of sinfulness. Uh, for instance, there was a very good book by a Prozent, um, or at least Prozent Publishing Press, uh, last year, A Human-Shaped God, Theology of an Embodied God by Charles Hatton, who's not a member of the church. 
and he's actually commenting on Exodus 32 and 33. And he says, Divine body parts other than eyes are mentioned in the Bible. The most curious example and one that has caused amusing speculation is the mention of God's backside in Exodus 33, 23. Moses asks to see God's glory. God agrees, but tells Moses it is too much for him to see the divine face. If he did, he would die. God tells Moses he could see his back. What precisely Moses saw is a matter of considerable debate. Some say God's backside was just that, the back of God's torso. However, others, including me, think it refers to God's buttocks. The face is the most individual and defining feature of a person's body. In many ways, the face is the person. It projects one's personality into the world. The buttocks is perhaps a person's most humble body part. It is a place out of which waste is expelled. God seems to be saying to Moses, you cannot handle my most radiant feature, so I will show you my most lackluster part of me. Now, some will get a giggle out of that, like, you know, uh, yes, basically God training in his backside. But this is to show, like, uh, this theologian, he's not a member of the church, and confessionally would hold to, like, the traditional, the absolute divine, simplistic view of God. He so, says, so are, you, are you saying that when God says he'll show his back, would you agree with this theologian that that's sort of like the correct interpretation that God showed his uh, buttocks? Is it well, at the very least, like he did see like a back part of his body. Okay. But, and if this is true, this means God has a three-dimensional bodily form. And yeah, as some true. part of that's God true, yeah, can yeah. actually be seen, which is like even then a totally important theological point, because one of the things we're jumped on, as I heard they say, is we believe even spirit is three-dimensional and bodily. You that's see. right. So... Yeah. So even if the scholar is wrong in saying it's not his buttocks, but it's still he, some type of his back parts of his body, it means mm -hmm. God, Moses did see actually a part of God's essential being here, his person, mm -hmm. which kind of goes against the idea like God can never be seen. It's just he can never see God's face. Unless, right. uh, uh, although we will see later, there is some qualification to that, and it's consistent with some of the qualifications Joseph adds in the Doctrine and Covenants and the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. Right. Uh, Jeffrey Tigay in his uh, commentary on Exodus in the Jewish Study Bible. And if one's actually looking for a good Jewish, uh, an Old Testament study Bible, this is like the 1985 JPS Tanakh with very good notes. So uh, if someone wants a good uh, commentary translation on the Old Testament um, to make sense of the... Because the Old Testament's a very difficult text, especially for novices, this is a very good source. Because my, uh, Tigay, um, he's commenting on verses 20 and 22 to 23, and he references 3.6, and we'll comment on that momentarily. But he says, according to Numbers 12, 8, Moses sees God's likeness, Hebrew Tamanah, which appears in poetic parallelism with face in the Psalms. And with reference to my hand, my back, my face, as known in the comments to 3.6, the Bible assumes that God has a human form, but but that seeing him would be too awesome for humans to survive. This is like a mainstream biblical scholar. He's Old Testament. He's Jewish. I'm not sure if he's a practicing Jew. But TK here just says, it's just taken for a given. The Bible assumes God has a body form. It's just man can't see him yeah. without dying because of his glory and so forth. Which should remind you of like um, section 67 of the Doctrine of Covenants. Mm -hmm. As I know here, TK makes reference to Exodus 3, 6, which the... Uh, Jewish Publication Society translation renders as, I am, he said, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. <coughs> now, a note for this, again, this is from Tige, as further supports the doctrine of divine embodiment, i.e. God has a body as a form, and that man can, under certain circumstances, see God. He was afraid to look at God. Although the Bible assumes that God has a physical, usually human-like form, Many passages suggest that seeing him would be too awesome for humans to survive. Exceptions include Exodus 24, Numbers 12, 8, Deuteronomy 34, Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28, which like Isaiah 6, like where God is on his throne and so forth. So, yeah. according to Tige, um, it's just taken as a given God as a three-dimensional uh, form, human-like. And man can actually see him under certain circumstances, but usually can't because it would be too awesome to survive his presence. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, this is uh, Nahum Sarna in his commentary on Exodus, so that's part of the JPS commentary series. Um, and I will, no, Exodus 33, 23 reads, And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face uh, shall not be seen. And uh, Sarna comments, My back, this during anthropomorphism is conditioned by the contrast and repeated use of panim, face, presence. Here the term means the traces of his presence, the afterglow of his supernatural effulgence, and must not be seen. No human being can ever penetrate the ultimate mystery of God's being. Only a glimpse of the divine, divine reality is possible, even for Moses. So here, like, you can see God, but you can never have, like, a full view of God. You can never experience God in his totality, in his complete radiance. Right. Was that because um, Moses and, like, the children of Israel were sort of, like, under the, uh, like, 
the lesser the mosaic law yeah after when he went up to sinai is that is that that, why that, would, that would be a factor as well because like exodus 32 and 33 set when the golden calf incident where and we'll address the golden calf momentarily and what that represented but basically okay. this god says to moses i'm going to destroy all the israelites except you moses and what does moses do he intercedes and god changes his mind and if yeah. we ever discuss god's foreknowledge that's a text that proves no question to my mind open theism but that's a different debate mm. but um so one of the issues is like even sinfulness and the covenant and a host of other theological issues but even outside of that not that this is not a factor but even outside that just because like we're fallen god is not and his glory and presence would be too overwhelming unless he were to shield us in some way right like he needs to transfigure us his spirit needs to almost like yeah fill you to in order to endure his presence yeah yeah like what happened to you a certain someone in 1820 yeah and yeah. also i think it's in the book of moses as well a similar yeah. scripture yeah in fact what you'll see here is like these biblical scholars who have no in some cases no god in the fight let alone no dog in the fight when it comes to mormonism mm -hmm. they'll come to very similar conclusions that joseph smith came to you as well uh, when it comes to the, no Joseph was not the only person that actually came up with these ideas. These ideas, like they've been around for a while, but he's the for, uh, he he did canonize them and put them into like divine revelation, but like uh, the ex cathedra, if you will, uh, wait onto them. Okay. Uh, there's a book that uh, by Peter or Curl in his book Jesus and the Angels and Theology and the Christology of the Apocalypse of John, and that fancy title is basically the Book of Revelation and its theology of God and Christ and angels. Although it could be argued that the appearance of the Ancient of Days, with details given about his clothing and the hair, hair of his head, seem to be contrary to the Old Testament precept that no man may see God and live. Exodus 32, 20 is referenced. Such a vision is, however, in line with other accounts in the Old Testament. Thus, in both 1 Kings 22, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, with all the hosts of heaven standing beside him, and Isaiah 6, 1, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, which I think is one of the texts you used positively in your video. Yeah. There is an implicit suggestion that God can be seen in certain circumstances. So, yeah. now, I know some will say, well, you know, Latter-day Saints don't believe the Ancient of Days is actually God. They, we believe the Ancient of Days is the Archangel Michael or Adam. And that's true, but notice here, it doesn't have to be, the author doesn't have to be correct that the ancient days is God, because he references other texts that do speak unequivocally of God in 1 Kings 22 and Isaiah 6. So, okay. his argument is not dependent upon the ancient days being identified by God. But again, we have a, a mainstream biblical scholar published by Cambridge, which is not a pro-LDS venue or some kind of a crazy venue, if you will, saying, again, the Bible, under certain circumstances, does say that God can't actually be seen. There are, rare there are rare examples and exceptions, but he can't actually be seen. It's not like an angel, or it's not a theophany in the sense of, like, God only shown, um, condescending down to, like, human level by speaking and appearing like a man. No, God is essentially three-dimensional, anthropomorphic, and right. can be seen under certain circumstances. So I think I've heard certain region. Christians interpret, like, for example, when uh, Stephen has his vision seeing the glory of God, Jesus on, Jesus on his right hand, that I've heard them interpret it as no one can see God, but he had just like a vision, which is different than God. Yeah, and some say like, oh, no, he only saw the glory of God, not God. And we actually, I, yeah. I will actually have some notes on Acts 7 near the end as well, so we'll cover that in some detail as well. Okay. Grand. And by the way, feel free to stop me if you need any clarification, but hopefully uh, so far it's... Um, no, uh, so far, um, yeah, following and cool. that what you're trying to say. Uh, Marion May Thompson, who I believe is actually a Roman Catholic, uh, she wrote an essay, Jesus, the one who sees God. And by the way, she's written some very good works on the Christology of John and the narrative of John. If God cannot be seen, it is not because God is invisible, but because God hides himself or because no one can see God and live. The possibility of seeing God always remains, but it is qualified in numerous ways to perhaps the character and nature of God and to the virtue or status of the particular individual or the variety of ways in which seeing can be understood. So, again, uh, in the work largely on the issue of Christology, Hurtado and Segal were leading scholars on Christology. This is like a fetch grift for them. Yeah. Uh, this Johannine scholar says, no, God can be seen, and he's not invisible. And we'll be addressing, like, is God visible or invisible? Uh, yeah, because there's a scripture by <laughs> Paul, I believe, that refers to God yeah. as invisible, implying that he can't exactly. be seen. Exactly, but here, and we'll be addressing, like, Colossians 1.15 and those texts as well, but here... Okay. Thompson says, God can be seen, but he he, he, uh, he can rarely ever be seen, not because he can't be seen, but he hides himself, you know, and a person has to be transfigured or some other thing has to intervene, if you will, 
before someone can actually see God. Yeah. And even then, it's always going to be diminished, like when it comes to Moses. Got you. Okay, so let me make a note on two texts that did not appear on the video, but I think they're important. Um, Genesis 16, 13 in the NRSV, and the NRSV, for those who know, uh, may not know, it's the it's a translation from 1989, it's my favorite uh, English translation. If you want a very good English scholarly translation of the Bible, uh, for the most part, I would suggest the NRSV. So, so i.e. Hagar, named the Lord, uh, who spoke to her, you are LRI, for she said, have I really seen God and remained after uh, alive after seeing him? So, Hagar seems to actually suggest she, she actually saw God. Now, uh, commenting on Elri and how it should be interpreted as both metaphorical, i.e. God favoring Hagar, and Hagar physically seeing God in a non-lethal way, uh, Theodore J. Lewis, in his book The Origin and Character of God, Ancient Israelite Religion Through the Lens of Divinity, uh, a massive book that came out three years ago, uh, wrote the following. And the quote is a bit lengthy, but I think it's rather, uh, it covers a lot of bases. Most scholars assert that Elri designates God El, and that me, just means God, seeing Hagar in the sense of seeing one's needs and rescuing one from a predicament, uh, a metaphorical interpretation. Many interpreters have def uh, deferred to Klaus Conan, who concludes his analysis by translating the original text of Genesis 16, turning as follows. You're the God who has seen, delivered me. Truly here I have seen, in the sense of met, the one who sees, delivers me. This analysis is in accord with many traditional commentaries dating back to at least as early as the medieval period, who have rationalized that there is little difference between the ra'ai that occurs in the middle of the verse and the ra'ai that is at the end of the verse. Yet the team, yet there is the possibility that ra'ai uh, could be uh, referred to in older tradition wherein Hagar sees the, uh, Hagar sees the deity. Um, Hagar is clearly the subject of Rati. This is the understanding behind the Revised Standard Version's rather free translation, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Such translations show the lasting impact of Wellhausen, uh, and Wellhausen is the one who uh, popularized the documentary hypothesis. Um, on the field, it was Wellhausen who, without textual run, run read uh, Elohim for Hello and inserted uh, and I lived prior to Ach Ari, uh, see the BHS apparatus. Uh, suffice to say that the corrupt state of the text will prevent us from resolving the passage. That seeing the deity can be a lethal, uh, lethal is a motive, well attested in biblical lore. A person cannot see me and live, Exodus 33, 20. At the same time, in special instances, a favorite person is allowed to see the divine without dying. In our passage, we clearly have God favoring, seeing Hagar, and Hagar seeing God in some sense of the word, whether it be physical sight and non lethal God sighting, or an experience of God's protection. Nahum M. Sarna, who we quote again, uh, argues that the vocalization El Rai demonstrates a marvelous ambiguity where the several meanings are intended to be apprehended simultaneously. It's not either or, it's both and, if you will. Okay, can you just summarize exactly what what is sort of like the the point or of this long quote? I've gone a little bit lost. Oh, no. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to quote Lewis in context. So, uh, right. basically, the verse says, Hagar sees God. Yeah. And some say, well, this scene is only metaphorical, and some are saying, this, no, this Hagar actually saw God, and he says, no, there's, it's ambiguous enough where it's actually both, it's a both and, ways. it's not either or, yeah. Right, okay, I got you. So, sorry about that, I just like, I wanted to quote him in full, oh, so, uh, yeah. Thank you. No problem. And Nahum Serna, who we quoted previously in his commentary on uh, Genesis, um, the vocalization of the second element, and by the way, vocalization in Hebrew was never rendered with vowels, and that sometimes can be a bit of a pain, because there's enough ambiguity here and there, like when it comes to this particular text. So, uh, you know, there's the Masary vowel binding and stuff like that. So, the vocalization, and that's what he means by vocalization, the vowel binding, of the second element occur, uh, occasions a marvelous ambiguity that permits the following translations in name. God of seen, that is, all seen God. God of my seen, that is, whom I have seen. God who sees me. So, it depends on how you point it. It could actually be one of the uh, to give an example from English, if you only use consonants, are you shipping, are you shopping, are you slipping, are you slopping? Um, so, most likely the several meanings are intended to be apprehended simultaneously. So it's not either or, it's both and. When God sees, it is, of course, that he shows his concern and extends his protection. When Hagar sees, she experiences God's self-manifestation. And, have I not, the difficulties in the Hebrew text are formidable, but the statement combines the scene and on the part of Hagar and God in both senses of the word. So the TLDR version is Genesis 16, 13 teaches that Hagar sees God. And that's yeah. in, not in some instance she was favored by God or shown mercy by God, if you're familiar with the Hagar narrative. But she actually sees God as well. So it's right. both hands. In okay. spite of some of the ambiguities of the Hebrew text. And is that why she was said, did I actually see God? Is that what it said in the scripture? Did I actually see yeah. God? Yeah, she actually sees God, um, and she was also favored by God. You know, it's, it's 
it's metaphorical and literal at the same time. It's right. Kind of double sort, double meaning. It, it, play, it plays on the uh, ambiguity as to the vocalization and the meaning of uh, the sea. Okay. Okay, I got that. Now, uh, Jesus in Matthew five eight says, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." Um, you know, mm. part of the Beatitudes, and um, and blessed are the cheesemakers, for you multiply in fans. But uh, with respect to the promise that the mm. pure in heart will see, oh, uh, oh, God, um, surely was he Buchanan, and Buchanan's more well known for his commentary on the Epistle of the Hebrews. But he wrote a very good book as well, uh, published by Brill, uh, "The Consequences of the Covenant," um, pages seventy four to seventy five, footnote ten, note of that. And this is a bit long, but it covers like a lot of biblical texts. So, um, okay. the promise that anyone would ever see God seems strange in life of other biblical testimonies, just as 1 John 4 2 said that no man can ever see God. Israelites were warned to stay back from Mount Sinai with its smoke and fire, lest they should look and perish. Moses was told that no one could see the Lord's face, Exodus 33 20, even though the Lord's presence would go with the people. Nevertheless, after the commandments had been given, Moses, together with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel, went apart from the people and saw the God of Israel. They saw a God and ate and drank, and that's Exodus 24. This took place at the festival at the top of the mountain covered with a cloud, again Exodus 24. Moses also reminded the uh, Lord that he uh, was seen face to face, and that his cloud stood over his people, and that the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Isaiah was in the temple when the place was filled with smoke, and he saw the Lord. Isaiah 6, which is one of the texts he used, where it actually says he actually saw Adonai, the second Hebrew word there, which means Sovereign Lord, or Jehovah, it's a substitute for Jehovah. Those who lived in the temple, i.e. the priests, were required to walk blamelessly in a certain uh, specified ways. He was do you believe that Isaiah saw, um, do you believe it was like Jehovah's and pre mortal Jesus? Christ? Uh, yeah, John 12, John 12 says that Isaiah saw his glory, and he quotes Isaiah 6, and some claim, well, you know, that's the suffering servant. I actually think it's both. He saw both the suffering servant's glory, but also the Lord's glory in Isaiah 6. Okay. Yeah, I do believe it's the very mortal Jesus. Okay. Um, in light of the uh, Gospel of John, and I say the Book of Mormon, it hints that it's uh, Christ as well, uh, in certain aspects, but yeah. But uh, but Jehovah can be used, of course, of the Father as well. Uh, I think we covered yeah. that in the uh, first one, but in this case, it's the pre-mortal Jesus. Okay. And, uh, just continuing, those who lived in him, uh, he who ascended to the hill of the Lord was required to have a clean hand and pure hearts. Rabbis understood the passage, because in a cloud I will be seen on the ark cover, to refer to the cloud of smoke made by incense offered by the priest on the Day of Atonement when he entered the Holy of Holies. And that's significant because the rabbis were often very anti-anthropomorphic. They opposed the idea that God had body parts. So the very fact that we actually understand the text he teach that would kind of show that, in spite of their traditions, not all, but many rabbis, uh, many little sources actually had a problem with God having parts, um, so much so that even some actually believe the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 was not God, but the Archangel Michael or some other figure, interestingly enough. Oh. But uh, that's kind of significant that, you know, they showed their hand by, like, um, when it comes to this, to refer to the cloud of smoke by incense offered by the priest in the atonement uh, when he entered the Day of Holies. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the incense was to be offered in such a way that the priest's vision there would always always be blurred by the smoke that he see God improperly. So, God could be seen, but, like, the smoke kind of covered the bases there. And right. the sources there to the Babylonian and Talmud yeah. and the, uh, yeah. Philo, uh, who's 1st century BCE, uh, insists that even when he entered the Holy of Holies, the high priest could not see anything. Um, and one source, uh, Rabbinic Essays, said, quote, It cannot be denied that the primitive notion was that the tabernacle and later of the t uh, on the temple in Jerusalem were the residences of God on earth and that of the Holy of Holies when the temple was especially the place where he, God, dwelt in the earth cover with the two Caribbean beings, so to speak, his throat. So, I know this is a long quote, but it covers all the biblical texts, really. Yeah. It shows even rabbinical sources who were very opposed to God having body parts by his essential being. They actually... Uh, sometimes give the game away, if you will, by saying uh, God could be seen, but like the incense kind of blurred him, and yeah, the Caribbean was his throne, and would speak at least anthropomorphically of God. And there's other biblical texts that do state God was seen and could be seen yeah. without qualification. Okay, so, got you. Uh, he states, the rabbis often sought to suppress or modify these primitive beliefs, i.e. the idea that God has a body and so forth, or at least to remove them from the crude anthropomorphic elements. But they were not always successful. These primitive beliefs were retained by the people, and echoes of them are found in the Talmud and the Midrashim, sources a few centuries after 
the New Testament era, even. It seems then that the experience in which Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple, again, the text you referenced in one of your, uh, in the same video, with the smoke and the fire, was a situation much like that of the priests offering sacrifice, and the like in that in which Ezekiel saw the likeness of the glory of uh, the Lord in the temple. Ezekiel said that the throne um, held one whose appearance was like that of a man, the term Adam. Both experiences were related to smoky, fiery situations in the temple, somewhat similar to that in uh, Mount Sinai, when the leaders saw God of Israel while their mantle was covered in the cloud, and also the description of the Lord who was seen in the pillar of cloud or smoke and fire caused by the burning fire at the tent of meeting. And he closes with this. After the wilderness wandering, the place where God could be seen was in the temple, and there only by those who had clean hands and pure hearts. In Matthew 5 8, to go back to the text we referenced, then those who had pure hearts were promised that they could see God. Tom Teon ops ontai. And this is the God, uh, a reference like you can see God. There's no like or as, there's no hint that this is anthropomorphic, uh, metaphorical here. In context of the Old Testament promises that were expected to be fulfilled, the Beatitude probably meant that those who had pure hearts would live to worship in the temple, where they, like Isaiah and the priests, could see God. And in Ezekiel 1 and other texts, like uh, 1 Kings 22 and Isaiah 6, it was actually in a temple context that they actually had this vision of God. So Jesus is actually right. harking back to these traditions in the Beatitudes, and it's been known by not just LDS scholars like John Welch, but many non-LDS scholars as well, that the Sermon on the Mount has temple themes and motifs all throughout. That's interesting. And I guess with Moses and, uh, you know, other of the Israelites who saw God on the mountain, like, if there's not a temple, mountains are considered, like, a holy place. Exactly. Um, and, and not just like, in the Israel religion, but the Canaanite religion as well. Um, like, uh, Mount Carmel was, like, uh, the most holy mountain for the uh, Canaanites in that area. That's why Elijah had his battle on Mount Carmel, uh, because uh, Carmel in um, Hebrew, you know, it's Karim and El, the vineyard of El, and El was not just a term for God, but also in this context, the chief God of the Canaanites, you know, um, because he was taught, he was believed to uh, dwell there and so forth. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and would you, would you say the point um, is that Matthew, that verse, Matthew 5, 8, that the pure in heart will see God, that uh, sort of supports the, the Old Testament, um, Record yeah, as well. it, yeah, it supports the Old Testament that like, man could see God in temple context, and it's not yeah. just like it's not only a vision. It's just like you know, this is just representation. It's um, purely symbolic. No, they did see God, and in this case, Jesus is borrowing from these narratives. So when he says, uh, you know, they'll see God, it's not like some kind of um, you know, they'll live to see these promises or some metaphor. It's a, a reality he's being promised here as well. Okay. And Matthew, of course, is the most Jewish of the Synoptic Gospels, so he knew the Old Testament very well. Um, so. Quotes a lot, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. And he, yeah. even when he seems to be abusing the texts, he's actually using the same Jewish methods of interpretation that were common at that time. And maybe that's a discussion for some other time when we discuss like, um, the Old Testament and the New Testament and Messianic prophecies and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe for something for Christmas, if you want. Oh, yeah, that could be good. Yeah, that could, that could be very yeah, good yeah. Christmas okay. time. Now, I did promise like I'd discuss a few texts here and there that if I were a critic of the church, I would probably use myself, or I would nuance, you know, so, and I do believe, like, it's, one has to steal man the argument, so I'm going to present, like, an argument most Latter-day Saints have never heard of, Yeah. but this is something that's appeared only in one anti-Mormon book, but if you're familiar with, like, some strands of scholarship, this could actually be an argument you, uh, that critics, if they were better, would use. I don't think it holds up, but I'll present the argument. So that's you sort of being... You could very easily just oh well nobody will know about this tax. So I, I've been collecting ma- I've been collecting material on this for seventeen years. I want to discuss it. It's okay. Yeah, you want to be thorough. You want to just address it. Now all. I, I address this topic in more detail on various blog posts. So if you type in go say golden calf or some other similar locution, you'll come across like loads of blog posts where it's reproduced non Elias scholarship on this. But the argument is like in Exodus thirty three, there's the golden calf, and there's uh, Jeroboam's calf in the northern uh, temple kingdom uh, temple in Bethel. And the argument is, well, especially in Exodus, um, why why is God so peed off at the Israelites over the golden calf? You know, and some strands of scholarship, both historic and modern, argue, well, um, what the Israelites did when they composed the calf is that this was actually a pedestal for an invisible God. The argument is like, well, the animal was a representation of the pedestal that the God... Uh, created about all, you know, and the argument is, well, you know, because there's no God on the golden calf, that the Israelites were showing that they did not believe God in his essential nat- uh, nature could be seen. He was 
by his essential nature invisible. Right. Uh, are you talking about me? Yeah, I got the following. And, yeah. and only one critic of the church has actually ever argued like that. That's uh, James Patrick Holding in his book from 2001, The Mormon Defenders, How Latter-day Saint Apologists Misinterpret the Bible. And I, I remember reading that for the first time in, back in December 2005, and I was kind of stumped because I never heard that argument before, and I'm guessing you've never heard that one no, before. Never, never. So uh, I decided to do what everyone should do, and I decided to look at the uh, commentaries and the scholarship, and fortunately I wasn't in minute at the time, so um, we, they actually had a good library. No, it's true, like, there are a number of scholars, and funny enough, like, one or two LDS scholars who have come out, like, the Golden Calf in Exodus 32, and that, though, the Exodus, uh, the Golden Calf's plural, that adorned the, um, or encircled the temple at Bethel of Jeroboam in the Northern Kingdom, uh, were pedestals for a deity. However, like, the majority of uh, scholarly commentary argues, no, what's actually going on is the bull was an animal representation of Yahweh. So, because in the Hebrew text, there's a Hebrew word for a pedestal, and it's never used of the golden calf or golden calves. What is used to describe what the golden calf was is the term Elohim. And you don't have to know Hebrew to actually know what Elohim means, right? Yeah. yeah. It's God. Uh, this is why, like you say, like these are the gods of Israel, or they refer to the Elohim in the Northern Kingdom. They were animal representations of a god. They were not pedestals for an invisible god. That might seem like a myth, but that's pretty important. And we do know, like, Yahweh, or Jehovah, however you want to vocalize it, I prefer saying Yahweh, um, in various inscriptions, such as inscriptions at Samaria, he's referred to as Calf Bull of El, or Calf Bull of God. So, making a representation of God or Jehovah as a bull was basically breaking the first commandment, you know, um, no gods before me and also breaking the other commandment, which is anachronic, i.e. against images of God, you know, um, so that's why God is so peed off, they're breaking the first and second commandment almost straight away. But according to a lot of scholars... So, so were, the, were the Israelites, were they, um, was the, the golden calf, was that almost them sort of like, this is a physical manifestation, or not manifestation, but like, representation, representing, yeah. Yeah, representation yeah. of basically a statue, yeah, being of, a yeah. different god in their mind, but it was still them um, making god, make, make it, making like a god. statue or an icon of god in this right. case, Jehovah, um, you know, yeah. so it, it's going against like a bunch of the uh, big ones if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, um, yes. yeah. but basically the scholars. Not all of them, uh, but a lot of biblical scholars, historic and modern, uh, believe that the golden calf, or the golden calf's plural, because they're referred to as Elohim because of the uh, inscriptions and because of other evidences, like um, the Canaanites depicted Baal, who was like the Canaanite equivalent of Jehovah, if you will, as a bull as well. And um, El, who was the chief god of the Canaanite deity, he was like a, uh, he was represented as a bull because he was so, um, he had a lot of kids, let's just put it that way. Um, it was seen as a sign of fertility and so forth in the ancient Near East, and you know, um, right. it, it, basically, this, the TLDR is like, no, the golden calf was a animal representation of Jehovah. Um, and if one wants like a lot of quotes, you know, I have loads of posts because I've been looking at this on and off for like seventeen years. Uh, but um, to give one example, John Day is like a non-LDS scholar and he's done a lot of great work on what image and likeness means in Genesis one and other texts. Um, he in his book, Hosea and the Baal Cult, and Hosea, the book of Hosea deals a lot with the Canaanite religion as well. It would appear that Jeroboam's aims in the Northern Kingdom with the Calves were to stop Northern tribes from going up to Jerusalem. It was like a rival temple. The Golden Calves would naturally have been understood as symbols of Yahweh, not pedestals, but symbols or animal representations of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the only known Hebrew personal name contained the word for calf, namely, Yahweh is a calf or calf of Yahweh, attested in Samaria, Ostracon 41, not long before the time of Hosea, coheres with this. So even in the um, Sitzen Laban, or the situation in life of the Israelites, uh, there were personal names where calf and Yahweh were combined together. Calf of Yahweh, or Yahweh is a calf. Now, the calf is a symbol or a pedestal. Well, not, uh, and that would not be the case if the calf was only a pedestal and not the God himself, if you will. Now, it might seem like a technical point, but like, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and another example is Mark Smith. Uh, he wrote a great book, The Origins of Biblical Monotheism, but uh, he also wrote a great book as well, which I'm quoting from, Where the Gods Are Spatial Dimensions of Anthropomorphism in the Biblical World, which is a mouthful. But he argues, <laughs> Although the extant evidence of, for the plural representations of Baal postdates the single calf of Jeroboam I, 
though it may have been traditional forms for presenting the emblem animal of the patron warrior god. The calves are not simply a pedestal. They are part of the representation associated with the deity called God's Elohim in 1 Kings 22 28, and they're also called Elohim or God in Exodus 32 to 33 as well. Under this form of collective plurality, uh, this may be the Elohim taught to bring the Israelites from the land of Egypt. So it's not the pedestal who can bring them, it's God, so they taught this was God. This proclamation may be uh, located when the ritual context to celebrate the divine victory over Egypt. The military term suggests ritual played out in a religious context that celebrates this victory, perhaps in anticipation of future victory, see Psalm 20. Accordingly, Jeroboam's cult arguably entailed a temple ritual celebrating military victory and homage paid to the divine victor in the act of kissing the bovine icon. So they actually did homage, and they did homage by kissing the icon. That only makes sense they actually thought it was a representation of the god and not a pedestal that's distinct from the god. Ah, uh, I got you. Okay. So, like, the, yeah, and um, I'm not going to read them all, but, like, uh, if those who want to read, like, Paul's, you know, this is one book from uh, Norban um, Hubble, Yahweh versus Baal, the Conflict of Religious Culture by Webkin Stock. And this is like a morbidly at the mountain of God story in theology, Exodus 32 to 34. Again, they argue it's not a pedestal, it's a representation of a deity, in this case, either Baal or Yahweh. Okay. And for those who want more information about this, uh, because I know this is rarely, if ever, discussed in LDS circles, let alone LDS apologetic circles, just kind of go on my blog and type in Golden Calf or Golden Calves, and you'll come across like a bunch of posts. Um, I've been looking at this like on and off for 17 years because I've never came across that argument before I read that book, but I've never come across it since then, but there's like some scholars, you know, peer-reviewed scholars, who still hold the pedestal interpretation. So if and when this ever comes out or ever is picked up by a critic, at least you know, oh no, no, it, it can be easily refuted now. Right, and just so I'm understanding Go the ahead. way critics use it, I'm sorry because this is kind of brand new to me. So, it's going to be new to everyone except me and maybe one or two others. Yeah, so so critics would view that, um, some critics would view that the golden calf is a pedestal um, to reach sort of like an invisible god, and they would use yeah, the yeah, argument that... Yeah, basically uh, it's the animal that's prayed in an invisible god, so like they would argue, well, if that's the case, that means uh, that they visualize god not having any parts, and whenever he appears, that's only like a way to communicate. Oh, okay, right. No, I just clicked in my mind. Awesome. Yeah, I got it. But no, uh, the majority of scholars or commentaries on Exodus or commentaries on the uh, particular issue, they would argue, no, this is more of a representation, representation. of God. And, the, and this, oh, is yeah. a te this might seem weird, but it is a test in uh, inscriptions. You have the Israel in the Canaanite religion, and of course the Canaanites and the Israelites were not just like genetically, if you will, similar, but like uh, there would be a lot of cultural overlap for better or worse. Sometimes worse because of idolatry, but... Um, yeah, so that's that also okay. explains what's going on and why God is so peed. Uh, you know, because they're breaking loads of commandments and we're basing in, in idolatry and making the cult image of God. When right. in reality, the cult image of God is actually man. That's the purpose. That's that's all point of Exodus one, well, but that's a different matter. <laughs> okay, that, that's something new I've learned. Okay. That's yeah, as I said, like I've only seen one critic bring this up, but I remember in two thousand five when I read that book, it's like I've never heard this before, and. So I decided like a uh, search for it, and it's been fascinating since then. And hey, you know, might as well share this information with some now. And you know, this is a call to critics, especially evangelicals. Uh, you gotta up your game, dude. Uh, read read the scholarship, and you could be able to do better uh, when it comes to interacting with us. But so. yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> okay. You wouldn't. The average person, even somebody who would be quite knowledgeable of maybe scripture, would probably have never uh, read that into the text. Never have noticed that before. To be fair, like I never noticed that until it was brought up to my attention, and then yeah, uh, yeah so. Uh, but I thought I'd share, like, because you know I want to like introduce a few new teens here and there, you know, as opposed to just repeat the um the standard it's stuff. It's but, amazing all the biblical scholarship there is. Yeah, and this is just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, but yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll address like the uh, Johannine text, and Johannine, of course, is just a fancy term for like gospel and epistles of John. Um, so okay. seeing gone, jo but before I kind of go, like, any questions or comments about the ex Old Testament stuff we discussed previously? No, no, I um, think that all makes sense. So I think the general sort of the summary or the point is that um, there, those passages, there's passages in the Old Testament where maybe God's face was veiled, but um, people c could have seen God, but they must, they had to be, you know, pure in heart, so, so to speak, and, and people had visions in like temples. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's, God. God, it's also significant that they sometimes appear in temples. That means like, you know, the uh, purification has been offered and so forth. Like you can see this mm -hmm. when Isaiah, like he sees the Lord, he realizes he's too impure. And what does do like when the um, seraphim kind of get a coal from the fire and uh, purifies him and now he can actually 
withstand his presence and not be feel unworthy and stuff like that. So I okay. think that's kind of significant as well. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do is like we'll address the uh, Shohani text now in your video and like. Uh, critics, I don't think you're a critic, but like critics also bring these up as well. Uh, for instance, John 1.18, uh, the King James says, No man had seen God, speaking of God the Father, at any time the only begotten, um, which is in the bosom of the Father, had he had declared him. Now, this is not the time to discuss it, but like if you use a modern translation, some modern translations will read a bit differently. Instead of like, only begotten son, or unique son, some will say, only begotten God, or unique God. There's actually a very important textual variation in the manuscripts. But, um, you know, and if you want me to come back to discuss, like, say, textual criticism and stuff like that, um, I'd, I'd love to. But this is, like, one of the major textual differences in the uh, Gospel of John. Uh, but it's not going to affect one way, way or another the uh, discussion here. Um, in John 5.37, And the Father himself, which had sent me, had borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Now, first of all, note the immediate context. He's speaking to the faithless Jews of the first century. He's not speaking carte blanche or... Um, you know, he's not speaking, like, say, in all cases and whatsoever. Uh, what's rather interesting, like, he uses the term idos here, which refers to, like, say, the physical representation or um, image of a person. And you can look at, I don't discuss it here, but, like, uh, just look at any good scholarly Greek lexicon, and it doesn't actually say God doesn't have a form. He, that actually does say he does have a form. Does, you've not seen that form. And interesting, like, even those who actually believe God by his nature is either invisible or just doesn't have a body. Um... George McAfee, who's a Christadelphian, uh, he kind of realized, like, this text is very problematic for our theology, where uh, it, it seems to indicate Christ not only pre-existed, but God has a form. He actually says in his uh, work. Yeah. yeah, he has uh, a shape, he has a form. Exactly. Like, he has a, a yeah, so, body of some Okay, sort. he may not be seen, but he does have a form that could be seen. But uh, here, mm. this subject, uh, the rejection of the pre-existence of Jesus, has always been a weak link of Christadelphian theology. Many of our arguments lack power in the case of such texts. I have came down from heaven not to do my own will, which implies a decision in heaven before he descended, or again, you have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Carrying the obvious implication that Jesus had, i.e. had seen God's form and God's shape. So, even if it's only Jesus who has seen God's form and shape and no one else has, this doesn't mean God can actually be seen in some circumstance, even if it's any pre-existence kind of state. Can I but, ask a question on that? Go ahead. The only thing that's going through my head is, in, in obviously our large saint theology, and we believe in the plan of salvation that we were all uh, lived with God before we were born in, in the pre-existence. Um, so I've, I kind of wonder, why does Jesus say that, you know, they've not seen his form or shape if we were all with? Heavenly Father in the pre-existence, we would have seen him then. Is he just... Um, it seems like he's just addressing them in mortality. Now, yeah, I'll say right. this. Yeah. Uh, the personal pre-existence of everyone was not really... Uh, I don't think it was like as taught or emphasized in the first century as it is now. Um, I think it was like something that may have been deduced and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's like, um, you know, when God says, like, the fall prophets, I have never known you, you know. Um, of course, he would have known them in the pre-existence, but because of their mortal actions, whenever God addresses people, it's never, like, right. with, yeah, with the pre-existence okay. in mind. It's just basically the here and now. So, yeah, I, I get that, but, like, uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's, and John, also John six forty six, which is part of the uh, discourse at Capernaum. Mm -hmm. Not that any man had seen the Father, save he which is of God, he had seen the Father, speaking of Jesus. So, like, at least on the prima facie reading, like, I can't understand, like, why some people would say, well, this means God, in this case, the person, the Father, can never be seen ipso facto. But again, if you read John, even in context, uh, he nuances it. Is, is Jesus implying in the scripture that he which is of God is only referring to Jesus? Oh, some think that's the case, um, you know, okay. but sometimes, like, being of God can also refer to, like, prophets and so forth, yeah, so like, like, in the context. Someone who's, who's, I don't know, like, righteous uh, or, yeah. or a prophet. Uh, yeah. and, and, and even, like, ignore, even presenting, uh, not that it's not important, but, like, even presenting from this, even John himself nuances what he means by that. Um, now, when it comes to, say, seeing something in the Gospel of John, like, seeing the kingdom of God, um, which is like a good allegist to like seeing God. This is from Carl Dienrich, uh, who himself is a Protestant, uh, in his recent book, The Story of Baptism. And he's actually a Trinitarian, you know, so, you know, he's, he would never bat for us. But he's actually seeing like, what does it mean to see the kingdom of God? And what he says here has like implications for seeing God and seeing other things in the gospel and epistles of John. When Jesus says no man can, uh, no one can see the kingdom, he isn't talking about understanding or grasping what it is or having the eyes of faith to know about it. Rather, Jesus used the word see to mean experience. Uh, 
For example, when someone says, I would love to see Europe, they don't mean they would love to understand or know about Europe, but rather that they would love to go there and actually experience it. Mm -hmm. In the same way, no one can see God's kingdom unless they are born again. Now, I would say it's true water baptism. He says it's true fate alone, but, you know, that's a different matter. A few verses later, that becomes absolutely clear when Jesus expresses the same idea in a different way, saying that those who are not born again cannot enter the kingdom of God. So basically, a TLG or a version is, when the Gospel of John says, seen like the kingdom of God or seen God, it's not proclaimed like, say, you know, seen X, Y, and Z, like physically. It's more about experiencing. And it's the same when it comes to the Old Testament. No man can ever experience God in his totality. And if you read the Gospel and the Epistles of John um, as something that's coherent, which I know is a minority view, uh, but at the same time, if you actually understand it to be like coherent or like the editors were at least consistent, uh, not that I believe that they're uh, editing to the Gospel of John, but that's a different textual matter. Um, that's how to take it. No one has actually seen God in his fullness. No one has experienced God in his fullness, at least in mortality. But even the Gospel of John recognizes man can actually see God. Um, and he's apostles, and we'll discuss that momentarily, but this is just a... Um, no, granted, he's talking about the kingdom of God here, but what he says about the kingdom of God is actually the same verb used in many of the passages as well, and that's kind of significant. So I might be jumping ahead, but... Um, so we know in like the book of Moses and Larry, seeing the scripture that Moses saw God. Yep. Um, did Moses... Are you saying that Moses didn't maybe see God in his fullness? <laughs> He, well, because he had to be transfigured, and even then, I don't think he would have experienced like God in his totality. No, I don't think anyone will until the hereafter when they have like glorified, resurrected bodies and so forth. But he would have experienced uh, God in a greater degree than what we can naturally, if you will. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, for instance, uh, one John four twelve, which is I don't think a text you use in the video, but it is sometimes used as well. No man had seen God any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and His love is perfecting us. However, even a Trinitarian who actually was very critical of the Church. Uh, Spiros Zodiates, who was an expert in Greek, I will note, noted the following in his commentary, uh, translation commentary on the uh, uh, first John. To behold, view attentively, contemplate, indicating the sense of wandering regarding involving a careful and deliberate vision which interprets its object, involves more than merely seeing. So what he's saying here is what's precluded is not seeing God per se, but experiencing God, contemplating God, having a full experience of God. That's what it means to see God in the Gospel of John Puzzles of John's sense. You know, and also uh, BDAG, which is like the leading Greek uh, lexicon, to have an intense look at something, to look something in with one's eyes with implication that is, uh, one is impressed. See, look, at, behold. So it's like gazing, having a full experience of God, not simply seeing God. Right, you know? okay. You know, like you can see God in a limited sense. And even in their theology, that's the case. But you can never experience God unless, of course, you're born again, you're in the kingdom, and so forth. So. Okay. Uh, and this is like the view of like many other scholars who themselves are creedally Trinitarian or some other theology that would be at loggerheads with our theology. Uh, for instance, uh, Alan Richardson, uh, in his commentary on St. John by SCM Press, which is a largely Protestant Anglican uh, venue, the invisible God has been revealed in Christ. The fourth gospel makes considerable play upon the idea of seeing with the natural eye or reason and seeing with the eye of faith. St. John denies that seeing is believing, he would say, rather that believing is seeing. And by the way, no eyes of fate, uh, this was not in a Dan Vogel sense, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's a joke. And this is like the view of like Manny's other scholars. Well, a reference to the witnesses? Yeah, it, it, it's a joke, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Leon Morris, who was like a staunch Calvinist, he would not like the church at one all. He had a very same view. Um, he even references Exodus 33.20. He comes to a similar view. Again, man can see God, but it's only in a limited sense. Uh, Matthew Paul, who was a 17th century Reformed theologian and a Trinitarian, he nuances it as well. Uh, uh, and even then, these scholars don't believe God in his essential nature has a three-dimensional body and so forth. But at the same time, they do understand it's about experiencing God in his fullness, if you will, or seeing God in the eyes of, not simply with the eyes of one's mind, but it's more than simply physical scene. It's a greater scene that no man can see unless, of course, they're born again and so forth. Now, I'm not going to quote all of these, but like, if you want to pause the video, um, does that does that tie in with um, like the the scriptures that say like you can't see God with your natural eyes, but with, yeah. with your spiritual eyes? Is, yeah, and yeah, that's basically what well. the uh, uh, altar of John, uh, the Gospel and the Epistles, is basically hinting at. No, God, John is a very Jewish gospel, and he knows the Old Testament well, so he knows about these texts that God appears in. In fact, he, in John twelve, he actually says that the uh, divine person in Isaiah six, you know, when Isaiah saw the Lord, that was actually the glory and the person of Jesus. 
um, uh, verses 48 and onwards, if, for those who want to look at it. Uh, Adam Clark as well, the Methodist, um, who some think Joseph may have uh, borrowed from when it comes to the JST. I don't think that's the case, but um, at the same time, okay. uh, he was a very popular Methodist uh, preacher and commentator uh, of the time. He actually comes to a very similar conclusion as well when it comes to John 1.18. Uh, now, what's rather interesting, like even critics of the church, um, or venues that are very critical of the church, like Catholic Answers, um, they're no friend of Mormonism. Uh, they actually have to argue like this as well. Uh, Mark A. McNeil is a former Oneness Pentecostal, so former modalist, um, and that's kind of apropos for her discussions previously. He wrote a book in 2018 catalog, uh, discussing his conversion from Oneness Pentecostalism, which is very anti-Catholic to the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, all in the name, how the Bible led me to the faith in the Trinity and the Catholic Church. Um, now, because he's a one, he used to be a Oneness Pentecostal and held to a form of modalism, um, he would have held to the traditional view, you know, uh, God cannot be seen, and so on and so forth. So, what to do when it comes to texts, like, say, that seem to hint otherwise? He actually writes the following. Surely it is not possible for us to comprehend the nature of God. Consequently, the Bible speaks of our inability to see God. John 1.18, 1 Timothy 8.6.16. On the other hand, some individuals are privileged to see God, at least in a dark cloud, or by way of some visible appearance that God may temporarily assume, sometimes called a theophany. To complicate matters further, our heavenly hope is to see God, Matthew 5 h which we discussed previously. Yeah. If we seek to harmonize these various ideas, we are pushed to grant that, in some meaningful sense, humans have been given insight in God's nature, but that this insight may be qualified as far as a full grasp of the infinite God. Our hope is that the limited knowledge we now have of God will be far surpassed in the life to come. In life, these distinctions, it is possible to say that some men have seen, i.e. partial insight God, but at the same time, not have seen full comprehension God. Now, of course, Mark A. McNeil, because he's Catholic, believes in absolute divine simplicity, does not believe God actually has any uh, composition in his essential being. So that that's why he kind of has to argue for like intellectual scene and so forth. But at the same time, he even recognizes as a, an avowed Trinitarian these days and a critic of modalism um, that the Bible does, if you were to take the whole ball of wax as a whole, say that man has not seen God but only in the sense of has, having fully seen or fully comprehended God. But man has seen God, albeit in a diminished, shielded type of way. Right, okay. And would you say as well that the author of the Gospel of John, that John would have been aware that man has seen God, at least in a partial sense, from the Old Testament? So when it's saying that no man can see God, it's you can't see him in his fullness, full comprehension, yeah. which might go beyond even physically seeing, but like, all the different you know ways you describe yeah i believe you were to read the uh gospel epistles and if you believe revelation was if not written by john at least like johanning context and flavor um that is the case you know even is after Trump, the name of john in hebrew or what's what does johanning actually mean oh johanning just basically means it, it's the technical term for like all the writings associated with the john like the gospel okay. of john one two and three john you know you, it's like a pauline uh, epistles that's all the epistles associated uh, with yeah. paul so okay okay um and this is the view of like early christians as well i'm not going to quote all of it but Irenaeus of leon he was a bishop in leon france modern france in 180 and he wrote like a f massive five volume work against heresies largely against the gnostics but he also focused on say oral tradition and scripture uh, if one ever studies early Christianity, it's a text you have to read, although it, at times it can be a bit of a trudge. Um, and spoiler alert, I'm actually going to be using quite a bit of it in the uh, forthcoming debate on Mary. But um, he basically argues in a very similar way that man in mortality and earth and state can never see or fully comprehend God. But in the hereafter, the promise is that we will uh, see God in a greater sense, you know, um, how God will render himself visible, men therefore shall see God, you know, in the hereafter, men live being made immortal by that side, in that God should be seen by men who bear and spirit him, and you always wait patiently for those uh, he's coming. Now, I'm not saying Irenaeus was a proto-Mormon. Uh, he believed in creation and not in, um, and a number of other topics. At the same time, what I am saying is, early Christians, even as early as 180 when he wrote this work, so late second century only, this harmonization or this understanding of the nuances of God being seen and cannot be seen is actually there. You know, uh, they don't think, they don't just throw up their hands as many, not all, but many critical scholars do these days and say, oh, it's a contradiction. They understand, like, um, it's from the same author, and this author would have known the Old Testament, so um, 
have, have a bit more mature understanding of what's going on, but at the same time, he understands it to some degree, as how Latter-day Saints would. God can be seen, but in the here and now, it's only a very diminished way, and sometimes it's not the case, but in the hereafter, we will see God in his fullness, he'll make himself visible, and so forth. Right, and and are you saying that that verse in Matthew 5, it could be interpreted that way as well, like the pure in heart will see God, that yeah. could also be interpreted like in the next life, you'll you'll be in his kingdom and you'll see Yeah, because we'll only really be fullness. perfectly, we'll only be perfectly sanctified or holy in the hereafter. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it, it's like, uh, it's like when it comes to the, uh, 548, be derber for, er, perfect. We have to strive to be perfect. We have to strive to be holy. And at the same time, we understand the full ramifications or the full completion of that will be something that happens in the hereafter. But he ties this in, um, to like say the hereafter and the promises of the faithful and that we will see God, you know, so. Right. Okay. Um, this is also the view of Marius Victorinus. Um, he's not really well discussed in Christian circles because one, not a lot of these writings have persisted, and two, those are, cost quite a lot of money, but I'll let people pause. But again, he references the same text and comes to your very similar conclusions. And um, once you compare and contrast it, what well, well, Irenaeus and others believe with the very naive and simplistic view of some critics, like this is Bill Grover, and man made God in his own image, the misbegotten Mormon doctrine of deity. And just from the title, you can actually know, you know, he's no friend of our theology. Uh, the Bible elsewhere says that Jesus Christ is the only one to ever see, ever seen the Father, uh, John 1, 18, which we now know is not the case. How many have seen the Father? Many? Nope. A few? Nope. Joe Switch? Nope. But Joe's corrected translation, the JST, fixes 1, 18 to read, No man had seen God at any time, except he had borne record of the Son. Mormons changed the writings of the Bible's teaching in order to substantiate Joe Smith's blatant dis- delusional tenets. How can anyone not see the so very obvious Mormon deception? So, you know, I'll let people... Uh, compare and contrast what comes before this presentation and what comes after with this kind of very naive, simplistic understanding of the Gospel of John that's all too common. Yeah, I'm not saying you have this one. Typical, yeah, by uh, the way, I'm not saying you have the simplistic view because you raise it, but like this is just, this is freaking absurd, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, not all evangelical critics are bad, like, but this is just like representative of the uh, very poor um, approach to texts that yeah. some of our evangelical friends tend to engage in. Yeah. So, okay, uh, so any questions on the uh, stuff about John before I discuss the, uh, some of the other texts like One Timothy and God being invisible? No, no, I think that made sense. Awesome. Okay, so One Timothy 6.16 says, Who had only had immortality, speaking of God the Father, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, many people, you know, when it comes to, say, a prima facie reading of the text, say, well, no man can ever see God. One Timothy 6.16 says this. Uh, case closed. You know, no such thing as seeing God. You know, um, the problem though is like. I remember watching a YouTube video, I think it was a short one, and one person was like, I have one Bible verse that totally disproves Mormonism. And Matt Slip. Matt Slip uses this, this one. This is the verse he read, and it's almost like case closed, that's it. Yeah. Now, uh, my friend James Stutz actually has a great article on 1 Timothy 6.16 and the LDS interpretation that was published by Interpreter back in, I think, 2014. So, if someone wants, like, a uh, very good discussion about that, um, look it up. It's very good. I'm going to be approaching things a bit differently, but it's complementary to, like, how we approach things here. Now, uh, the JST reads a bit differently. This is from New Testament Manuscript 2, page 137. Whom no man hath seen nor can see, and to whom no man can approach, only he who had the light and the hope of immortality dwelling in him. So we see Joseph Smith trying to, um, he changes the text, but I would argue this oh. is like, I don't believe this is a restoration of the text, but this is like a harmonization of uh, the Bible as a whole. I actually but, didn't know that he um, did a, you know, inspired revision or translation of this passage. See, okay. when it comes to the golden calves and the JST, you're learning something new as well. So, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's good. Uh, now, Robert St. Uh, that should be Robert A. St. Uh, in his commentary on the pastorals, and St. Genis is a very traditional Roman Catholic, uh, so much so he's actually a geocentrist. He's a former Protestant, but uh, he's also like a staunch Trinitarian, so again, he's no friend of the church. In fact, he says the church is an evil cult, and Joe Smith was an Eastern adulterer. So... You know, this is an example of just me using the critic of the church. Yeah. In habits, light inaccessible. Uh, first icon, um, Afro Istan. That is, light so bright that no one is able to approach it, uh, according to B. Dag, otherwise known as the Visio Dei, the vision of God. This light is not that which was created on the first day, since the light that surrounds God is uncreated and immortal. Only the new resurrected body will be able to see God as he really is. 
Matthew 5, 8, for instance, is quoted. Otherwise, God is invisible, and he references these texts. Sometimes God localizes himself, and thus Moses was only shown God's back parts, but he was not able to see God's face. It can also be said that Moses was given extra, extremely modified expressions of God's light, as in the lighting of the Shekinah glory uh, cloud. So, according to St. Janus, God can actually be seen. You know, in some cases, he's actually even localized. It's just like, this text is speaking about how, you know, mortal status or fallen status we can actually we cannot approach god unless grace god intervenes uh to do something to bring that about and that's true even latter day saints would agree that on our own we can't see god we can't withstand his presence unless grace god intervenes and does something either to like uh decrease his presence or to increase your holiness or or ability to withstand his presence yeah, and that's sort of like being transfigured. and Exactly. Like when Joseph said he was filled with the Spirit of God, like Moses as well. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, James White, uh, who you've heard uh, of, and he's, again, no friend of the Church, he had a debate in 1999 where he addressed this text, and he actually says it does not mean that God cannot be seen, because think of the ramifications. Was Christ in his person God? Yes. Was he seen? Even if you want to say he was only in mortality, he was seen. So what gives? And this is from his, does the New Testament teach that Jesus Christ is God? In 1 Timothy 6, 16, it talks about no one has seen this unapproachable light. It doesn't say they have not seen the person, but the unapproachable light. That passage may actually be about the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact. So Roy, who's, the term anti-Mormon does fit him. I, I, I don't use that term a lot for people. I don't think Vogel is an anti-Mormon, um, you know, and other critics, critics like Metcalf, I think they're critics, but I don't think they're anti-Mormon. I think they mean well, even though I think they're wrong. Why is an anti-Mormon? And he's written, like, loads of anti-LDS books. Even he says, like, oh, actually, in context, it's not talking about the person can't be approached. It's the unapproachable light that can't be seen. And he's no friend of LDS theology. He thinks, he thinks it's idolatrous. He thinks it's blasphemous. Uh, he thinks praying to uh, God, the Mormon God is on par with the sinfulness of homosexuality. He said that in his book, uh, Is the Mormon My Brother? So, um... He, he's no friend of ours, and even though he realizes, like, it could be about Jesus, but even if it's not, it's only seeing the unapproachable light can't be seen, not the person, which would indicate that there's um, exceptions, if God makes the exceptions, if you will. Right, so when it says, like, who no man has seen or can see... He, he, he believes it's about the unapproachable light, not the person, oh, okay. per se. Not the person, okay. Yeah. Now, um... Uh, there was a great book that came out in 2015 by an evangelical person by the name of Andrew Malone. Um, and I think everyone should read it, even if you disagree with the central thesis. It's a very good book, and it's only like 12 or 13 euro. He basically addresses the idea, like, um, that's very popular, that in the Old Testament, whenever God appeared, it must be the person of Jesus. It cannot be the person of the Father, because of the assumption... I was assumption... that question. Yeah. Was, was Timothy... Uh, what was it? First Timothy 6, you just read? Yeah. Um, uh, is not referring to the Father, but James White believes it could be referring to Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah but uh, I do believe it's about God the Father, not Jesus. But be that as yeah, there's still a Christological true. problem, like, um, well, what about the second person of the Trinity or second person of the Godhead? But uh, Malone kind of realizes, like, oh, you can argue it was Jesus, but you cannot say the Father cannot be seen, ergo it was Jesus, if that makes sense. He basically argues... Now, he doesn't believe all the Christophanies, or, um, or I should say the appearances of God in the Old Testament, the Theophanies, are necessarily the second person of the Trinity, or the pre-mortal Jesus. He realizes that would mean that there's some kind of difference, substantially, or by nature, between the Father and the Son, and you can't have that if you're a Trinitarian, because the Father and the Son, as well as the Holy Spirit, are what's called consubstantial, or of the same substance, or of the same nature. And I address this momentarily, so he kind of realizes, like, that's a problem. Uh, if you yeah. think, if you, if you have that of the prior uh, assumption, that that leads to Trinitarian problems like Arianism or Modalism or some other non-Trinitarian theology. Um, of they course, we have they're omni omnipresent, which means they're sort of like fill you know the vast expanse of the universe, like they're everywhere. So it's like, how do you? separate them if that makes sense yeah it does and if you ever want me to like address trinitarianism not just modalism in the future we can actually go through that um and the different materials but yeah there's loads of problems when you can say it can't be the father now you can say it was the son and not the father but you can't say it cannot be the father because only the father because that would mean that there's attributes of god in his nature god the father in his nature that differs from the attributes and nature of the son and that's anti-trinitarian so he, he had, had really good books. share all the same attri attributes and, and substance and so forth yeah oh, okay, okay. so he actually addresses these texts and say it does not mean what we 
evangelicals and other Trinitarians seem to think they are. And by doing so, he actually undercuts a lot of arguments against our theology of seeing God and the very nature of God. And I really don't know that he likes the church, you know, so... But at the same time, even then, he kind of realizes, like, a lot of these arguments we evangelicals use, they're not good. And by doing so, he kind of uh, pulls the rug under a lot of the proof texts and arguments used against us, publicly as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a great book. I'm going to quote a bit of it, so uh, just bear with me, but I think it's worth the uh, wait. So, he argues, in the first and last chapters of this letter, 1 Timothy, so 1 Timothy 1, 17, 6, 16, Paul breaks into the praise of the King, Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen nor can see. Once again, the New Testament seems to teach that God cannot be seen, and thus has not been seen. Case closed? This may be a way of praising God's excellence without fully defining him as never seen, never mortal, and so on. Thus, we need to determine whether Paul is praising God this way, because God is unique in all these respects, or whether Paul is using this idiom as part of his rhetoric, without intending these claims to be taken as absolutes. So this is like, uh, he argues this is hyperbolic language, it should not be taken um, absolutely, as in, you ignore the entire context, or he's saying only the person the Father is invisible, or only the person is immortal. Long story short, reading these as absolute claims creates many different difficulties than if we see them as a way of exalting God with superlative idioms basically exaggerations. Consider the problems if we insist that Paul is being completely definitive. The word only re recurs several times in these doxologies, and doxology is basically a praise, you know, a glorification okay. or praise of someone. Uh, praising the only God, the only ruler, the King of Kings, Lord of Law, Lords, who alone or only is immortal. We have to uh, presume that Paul is describing God the Father. If the Son is addressed in any way, a new dilemma is created with the Son himself praises invisible. But then it's the Father who is the only ruler. Common sense tells us that the word only, the term monos in uh, Greek, is being used in a special way, not least because there are other human rulers named in Scripture. Moreover, the last book of the Bible says it's a resurrected Lamb, God the Son, Jesus, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what does it mean that the Father is the only one who has immortality? Have we just denied the immortality of the Son and the Spirit? Paul teaches elsewhere that our own mortal oh, yeah, bodies will look forward to immortality and the imperishable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The same terms that belong only the Father, according to 1 Timothy, though not always clear in English translations. And he ends with this, and this is pages 161-62. to Rather, words like only must have a relative sense. God is being contrasted with any potential rival and protected from any comparison. Paul affirms four truths about God's sovereign power, four ways in which he is altogether beyond human control or manipulation. In idol-filled Ephesus, where Timothy is ministering, pagans could approach and view their gods at any time. But the true God, by comparison, is unapproachable and invisible. And we addressed what it means to be invisible momentarily. Again, we're dealing with relative language. As in the Old Testament and John's Gospel, Paul is emphasizing that our God cannot just be tracked down on a human whim. The Old and New Testaments affirming that God can be approached through Jesus. Relatively speaking, God is unapproachable. Relatively speaking, he is the only one who controls immortality. Relatively speaking, God is not seen. Although it can feel like a subtle distinction, contrasted with the visible, is not the same as saying never visible. And so the notion of God's invisibility, the foundational evidence for Old Testament theophanies being contrasted as Christophanies, i.e. appearances of Jesus, continues to evaporate. Now, that's a bit of a linear correlation, but I think this is excellent ammunition for any Latter-day Saint apologist when dealing with uh, our evangelical friends. It's like, guys, let's just say, for the sake of argument, you're right. This means only the Father is immortal. Jesus, even ignoring the incarnation, Jesus, even as a divine person, doesn't have innate immortality. His immortality has to come from some other source, and so, same with the spirit, you know, which would mm. kind of cause loads of problems. That means by nature, the sun is not immortal. By nature, the spirit is not immortal. Ergo, they're not consubstantial with the Father, and that's Trinitarianism destroyed. Um, and there's loads of other yeah. issues as well. Yeah, because if, if God alone has immortality... Speaking of the Father, yeah. Yes, the Father, um, and if it's the father that raises Jesus from the dead, but he doesn't have immortality of himself, then that he can't be co-eternal. Um, or or even co immortality with respect to his divine person, let alone, like, say, his resurrected body, just like he's being of God. Even then, he's being the God is not innately immortal, so even then, that's problematic, no matter how you cut it. Right. Okay. You know, so he understands these are relative terms, and Paul is like, because it's a doxology, it's praise, and it's going to be exaggerated. Not that it's theologically in error, but like, you should not take an all or nothing view of this. So you're saying that Paul's sort of like praising God and exaggerating a little bit? Yeah, he's using like, uh, because it's, um, 
well, he's using relative language here. So, like, okay. when he says he's the only one, well, it doesn't mean he's the only one in the sense, like, no one else has, but, like, he's the ultimate source or ultimate fountain, if you will, of this. Right, okay. And, yes, he can be seen, but, like, um, you know, when it says, like, he's invisible, it's not a spe- And Malone actually addresses the invisible text as well, and he undercuts his evangelical uh, friends who are critics of our church as well, unknowingly. Hmm. He says, no, God can be seen. So, like, um, it just means he can't be seen in the sense of, like, you know, your wife is not invisible, but I can't see her because she's not on the screen. You know, that's what the type of invisibility the Bible is actually talking about. Again, like what you pointed to earlier about God sort of hiding himself. Exactly, yeah. And I okay. actually addressed this momentarily, but uh, does that so far make a lot of sense when it comes to the 1 Timothy passages? Yeah, yeah, it's making sense. Yeah, and by the way, like um, the book, every Latter-day Saint should read it, because even if you disagree with the central thesis of the book, i.e., it's not always Christ who appears in Old Testament passages. It it's a very good apologetic tool without being an apologetic tool for Christology. <laughs> okay, so related to this, what about texts that speak of God being invisible? You know, Colossians 1.15, 1 Timothy 1.17, which we address momentarily, um, as well as Hebrews 11.27. And I'm not sure if you ever had these texts thrown at you on your mission, but like these are rather common texts to be used no, against I, I've de- I'm familiar with one in Colossians, the one Hebrews may, it may ring a bell, but okay. I can't. Don't know the passage off the top of my head. No, it's fine. Uh, well, what, Colossians one fifteen, and they all use the term aoratos in Greek. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. One Timothy one seventeen, which uh, we discussed momentarily with Malone. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And Hebrews eleven twenty seven, which I don't know why some critics bring this up. Uh, By faith he Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So God sees him who is invisible. Now we'll see. This is not actually a contradiction, but like um, if you were to take an absolutist view of or critics do, uh, this not only undercuts their theology, this undercuts inerrancy because. That's saying X and not X at the same time. <laughs> but, yeah, these these are the invisible texts, if you will, or at least explicitly invisible texts in the New Testament. So, what's going on? Mm. Now, Latter-day Saints have no problem with actually calling God invisible. Uh, for instance, Brigham Young, who had a very anthropomorphic and a constant deity, especially in light of the Adam God doctrine, which maybe we might discuss in the future once I'm finished with a uh, project about that. Yeah. In a sermon from March 21st, 1858, uh, he actually refers to the Lord Jehovah as our invisible leader. So, like, that really seems to have no problem with calling God invisible. But how we would nuance it, and I would argue the biblical authors would nuance it and understand it, is God by nature is not invisible. He just cannot be seen. And that's the difference. Again, to use the analogy, yeah. for instance, you have a wife, but she to me is invisible, or eoratos. Not that by nature she is invisible, but she just can't be seen because, you know, she's hiding herself from the camera. You know, that, that's, yeah. that's the analogy that's af- that uh, is a very, very good explanation as to what aoratos, or invisible in the Greek, means. You see? Okay. And this is not just like me as a Latter-day Saint with my bias here. Um, again, to quote Malone, uh, and again, everyone should read Malone's book, it's excellent. Um, it does kind of show the problems of, like, Trinitarian theology if you push it too far. The meaning of invisible. Scholars may sometimes intend invisible in a nuanced fashion. The word is no longer adequate as a convenient shorthand. It is now too easily misunderstood and any nuance overlooked. We need to reconsider what we understand when encountering this word, and what the biblical authors themselves intended us to understand. And that's very important, what the, yeah, the biblical important. authors use. Yeah. As the Old Testament drew to a close, Greek taught increasingly flourished. Philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle probed the visible and invisible realms. Plato especially was fond of describing divinity negatively, uh, and that's called apopatic theology, using like you can't say um, it's an apopatic or negative theology means saying what you can't say about God. Like we, you can't say God is X, Y, and Z, but more, but not like say what well, we can make positive affirmations like God is X, Y, and Z. You know, that's what uh, that means. Um, God should be unlike anything in the imperfect creator order. If creation is visible by definition, God must be invisible. And so a new Greek term was birthed: the adjective for visible or oratos. It's of only recent, sometimes written. Horatos. You know a a oratos, and a is usually in negation. It's a oratos that occurs in key New Testament texts, the ones that we quoted, and that has submitted the notion of invisible in Christian language. Before controlling such passages, it is instructive to consider how other Greek authors of the era understood and used the word. And whenever you look, look at a word, how it's used, you have to look at how the contemporary authors wrote. Because yeah. the New Testament, for instance, it was written in Kinetic Greek. And yes, it's inspired scripture, and like say Josephus and Philo is not. But God used the language of the time to convey his message. And that's why, like, uh, looking at how other people of the time, and that's called synchronic interpretation, used the word or concept or phrase. And that 
uh, very important for like lexical or word studies. Um, so Josephus's life overlapped with Jesus' disciples. He's years are 37 to 100, so actually contribute with the author of the New Testament books. Josephus uses uh, oratos to depict things that are not seen more than things that strictly can not be seen. Again, to use the analogy of your wife, you know, she's invisible to me, but she that doesn't mean by nature she's invisible. Yeah. At least yeah. five of these seven uses mean this. He describes the... So I think your sign's gone, Robert. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, that's... Yeah, we're back. We just had some technical difficulties, but uh, what we'll do is like I'll I'll just uh, proceed from the um, can man see God passage. Okay, uh, that can be seen. Uh, nope. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, technology, it works whenever you don't want it to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, uh, well, we were discussing, like, how Josephus used the term Aortos, so, like, it's use of a, um, a cave at the bottom of a well, the deep valleys around the fortress, Mesa of Masada. You know, things actually do have form and shape, you know, it just can't be seen. Only once does he describe something that's intrinsically invisible, the human soul, which remains invisible to human eyes, just as God himself. This application, including the mission of God, is important, but the early uses of Aortas confirms only that something is unseen. It does not explain why that object is, uh, cannot be viewed. Now, this same sense is attested by other contemporary author Plutarch. Soul and divine forces are invisible, especially when he echoes forebears such as Peter and Aristotle. Yet Plutarch also uses the word for tangible items hidden from view. He writes of captive women who have been cloistered for men, um, you know, how they're incommunicado and invisible to others. He describes war catapults and signal fire strategically stationed be invisible to the enemies. The Greek word aortos has the broader sense in, and the English translation invisible may be too narrow or misunderstood. So we have this evangelical Protestant who's a Trinitarian by T.L. She's saying, lads, uh, when we describe God as invisible, it doesn't mean what you think it means, you know, to borrow from the Prince's Pride. Hmm. Um, he continues, scholars who delve into the origins and application of the word confirm this broader sense. One wide range of study of Theophany's appearances of God, summarized in this way, in classical Greek, invisibility is normally affected by materially obstructing visibility. It is not at all a statement about intangibility. A standard Greek dictionary likewise promulgates the spread of meaning unseen, not to be seen, invisible. Um, you know, and that comes from... Um, a uh, PhD dissertation in the Bible and Quran in early Sunni Islam. Maybe Dan Peterson's familiar with that source. And then he ends, and this is from pages 47 to 50. Uh, th this is further affirmed by a similar negated adjective in the New Testament. Preaching in Athens, Paul mentions an altar dedicated to an unknown God. Paul means a God not currently known, rather than one forever noble. Jesus offenses with the Pharisees about people eating with unwashed hands. He obviously meant hands that have not been washed rather than those that cannot be washed um, uh, right. yeah so if you have if you have a kid with a um you know who doesn't want to wash your hands before dinner you better make sure they actually don't know uh, how to abuse the greek language you know <laughs> <laughs> the general consensus backed by uh, paul's own explanation is that the inexpressible words he heard in the heavenly vision are not cleared for publication it's less likely he is describing concept for which there is no adequate language a similar phrase occurs elsewhere as paul describes the spirits interceding through unspoken groanings, though less consensus exists here, most scholars affirm that the spirit could, but does not, articulate he says, intercessions. In short, there is every basis to take such negated adjectives as describing something that, for whatever reason, does not happen. There is no claim being made as to what, whether it could happen or not. This means it's very wise to translate aortas as something that is currently unseen, not something that is permanently invisible. And if you're familiar with like, traditional Latter-day Saint responses to these texts, this is exactly what Stephen Robinson and myself and others have seen. It's not saying God is intrinsically invisible, it's just he cannot be in, cannot at the moment be seen for some reason or some obstacle. Yeah, and again, it's going back to that analogy you gave of my wife, she's not invisible, but you can't see her at the minute. Cause she's yeah, and, and if I was a biblical author, I would say that your wife is aoratos. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, like English 
um, you know, if you see invisible, you think by nature invisible, as opposed to you just cannot be seen. Yeah. yeah uh, but when it comes to the Greek, even if you were to like engage in what's called rouge, uh fallacy or the etymological fallacy, yeah, it doesn't mean not seen, uh, but it does not mean even then. Um, That's like the Greek translation or meaning of was it a aortas. Uh, a is the negation, and ortos means can be seen. So, um, yeah. okay, and that's basically the root. No, so looking at the etymology of the root of a word is important, but claiming like that is one to one correspondent with the meaning. That's called the root fallacy or the etymological fallacy. Uh, to give an example, if I were to say you're a dynamic person, that does not mean you're explosive. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to say that to my wife later. You're no. Um, <laughs> As it should be noted, like, no, this is not like, say, you know, uh, LDS versus Trinitarianism, but I do mention this, like, most of our critics are, theologically, are Trinitarian, of some flavor. Especially uh, in this topic. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the problem there is, like, the, as noted by Malone and others, uh, if you push the envelope to its logical conclusion, there's problems when it comes to advocating uh, consistent Trinitarian theology and Christology, theology of Christ, when it comes to these texts. Because, um, as you've seen, if you claim there's something different about the person, the pre-mortal person to Jesus, than God the Father, in that one can be seen in his divinity, but the other cannot, that means that there's a distinction in the substance. They're not consubstantial yeah. with one another. And there's other issues as well. Like, mm -hmm. if one can be 616 is to be taken at face value, you know, and absolutized, it means only the person, the Father, is innately immortal. So really, if... If a, a Christian or a Trinitarian use this passage to uh, almost in a way disprove our our belief or our religion, they they're shooting not. themselves in the foot. Yeah, without even realizing. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, now, many uh, as many Latter-day Saint apologists have noted, uh, Trinitarians like Matthew Slick, who use uh, these texts, you know, he's using like using the One Timothy six text. Uh, absolutizing and absolutizing is basically taking an all or nothing approach to something and in the same way they are willing to do would result in it being used not only as a valid proof text against their theology but trinitarian theology where the person the father can be the only divine person and only the and only person who's intrinsically immortal it basically would lead to unitarianism that's basically the long and short of it not trinitarianism indeed such have been used in like manner by john carter who was actually a leading advocate of unitarianism uh, he was a well-respected christadelphian author he was the editor of the equivalent of the insider the liahona for a number of decades and he wrote a book uh, god's way a restatement of the full christian uh, gospel and like us they're restorationists but they're radical unitarian restorationists but they believe god is a single person christ is not god and he did not pre-exist his conception in Mary. And he actually uses these texts in like manner. You know, he uses Deuteronomy 6, John 17, the standard proof texts our critics use against us. He actually understands them in the same way and much more consistently as a Unitarian. There's no three persons in one and gymnastics when it comes to saying the meaning of one. But he has yeah. to ignore the scriptures by the pre-mortal Jesus. You know, yeah, he they, they struggle with that as well. But he uses this, like, uh, when he's using, like, uh, 1 Timothy 6, uh, 15 and 16 at the end, and I was just using the entire quote, if you want to read it for its context, yeah. but he says, Paul affirms of God, the Father, who only had immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can see. In these words, Paul cannot mean that God was then the only possessing immortality, for at that time he wrote Jesus had been raised from the dead and given everlasting life. The angels also possess immortality, for on the testimony of Jesus, they cannot die. Christelvins don't believe in satanic or fallen angels, so they only believe only in good angels exist. They don't believe in Satan and demons uh, in the traditional sense, but that's, that's the nuance here. But both angels and Jesus have received their immortality from God. So, yeah, Jesus at this time he's immortal, but he's received. He's not intrinsically immortal. Yeah. You know, he has immortality. And uh, the Father alone has immortality inherently. It is, however, for the purpose of the gospel invite men to become heirs of this life. Peter says that God has given us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature and, and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Uh, a common text we use for our doctrine of theosis or deification. So, I'll let people read the uh, quote in full, but uh, here you have a Unitarian, a very strict Unitarian, uh, who doesn't even believe in a supernatural saint or a demon, um, actually arguing, well, this text, if you were to look at it and all in nine view, would actually result in a Unitarian, not a Trinitarian theology, because Jesus is not either in his being or in his person, however you want to, uh, uh, well, in his essential nature of God, if you will, or in his uh, person as the God-man is intrinsically immortal. Mm. He's only immortal, not simply in terms of his body or his humanity, but intrinsically immortal in all senses, only by God giving him immortality. He's right. dependent upon the Father 
uh, for immortality. Am I right? I think that there's scriptures that say that Jesus was like raised by like the power of God or raised yeah. by God, maybe like in the book of Acts. That there's things that that so that sort of implies that it was you know yeah it was god who resurrected him and so mm -hmm. forth no we, yeah. no the hard day saint theology has a way to answer that while holding like a very high view of christ and a high view yes. of man yeah um, but, but you're saying that it sort of would invalidate the the trinity in that sense it, holding the same assumptions and presuppositions it results in unitarianism yeah okay and my friend Chris Davis, who I think you've had some interactions with as well, a uh, special shout out to you, uh, Chris, a uh, great guy. He noted the following about the Christological problems caused by Trinitarians who claim the Father cannot be seen. Not that he has never been seen, but he cannot be seen. But that the divine person appeared in the Old Testament Theophanies, which predate Christ becoming mortal and taking on humanity and flesh, was the pre-mortal Jesus. Uh, this ultimately puts LDS critics, at least who are Trinitarian, uh, who uses this in their toolbox of arguments in a very shaky Christological ground. Think of it this way, I'm going to give three statements. One cannot accept, one can accept two of them, but accepting the third leads to contradiction. So it's like, you can have two, but you can't have three. One, Christ is, Jesus is God. Two, Jesus is seen by man. Three, man, not can, man, not, man cannot see God. Because think of a way, if you go, Jesus is God, Jesus is seen by man. Uh, that means man can see God. You can't see man cannot see God. Or right. Jesus is seen by man. Man cannot see God. Then you're basically a Socinian or an Arian. You don't believe Jesus is, is God in the same way as the Father is. So he says, because take one the Arians, they would view that um, Jesus was both fully man and fully God. And, but they would argue he was the one person. In their view, and you see this in Ephesus in 431 and Chalcedon in 451, the third and fourth ecumenical councils, most Protestants accept. Although Jesus has two separate natures and two separate worlds, he's one single person. That's against Nestorianism and Eutychianism. It's it's a bit of a technical debate, but if you want me on to discuss, like, say, conciliar theology and Christology and stuff like that, I would love to discuss that with you. But in their view, although he has these two different natures, and they're distinct, there's no overlap, he's still a single person, even after the incarnation. Hmm. Uh, okay. it's, it's, it's called the hypostatic union. Uh, that's the technical term. So, if you take one entry, Jesus is a god, man cannot see god, they deny that Jesus was truly human, and basically profess the heresy of docetism. And docetism is the idea like, Jesus appeared human, but he was never, but that was only a deception. Uh, he was never truly human. It's like the, uh, the poem about, like, say, you know, uh, one f uh, set of footprints in the sand, you know, and it's not because uh, sand people from Star Wars likes to work in single file to uh, hide their numbers, it's because Jesus was not truly human. You know, he only appeared to have suffered, he only appeared to have died, but he never actually did, because uh, becoming enfleshed, he's like evil to the Docetists and the Gnostics, and even John condemns it as Antichrist in uh, 1 John 4. So, if you take two and three, Jesus is seen by man. Man cannot see God to profess the heresy of Arianism, which was condemned at Nicaea 1, by denying Christ's divinity or that he is of the same substance as the Father. And they don't want to choose one and two, Jesus is God, Jesus is seen by man, because that's the LDS perspective. So, it's like, um, if you want to use these texts and you want to argue with these presuppositions, if you're consistent, you're shooting yourselves in the foot, lads. Right. Now, I'm not saying this means, ergo, man can see God, but, like, because many of our critics are Trinitarians, these are things you, they, at least Malone, although I don't know how much he knows about the church, he kind of recognizes there's problems anyway, even outside the Mormon versus Trinitarian debate. But when it comes to these, even if you, even if you are a Trinitarian, you have to admit, like, uh, a lot of the presuppositions and stuff like that, it's really faulty, so either uh, admit uh, Trinitarianism is false and become Unitarian, or at the very least, realize like a lot of these arguments against Hardy's in Christology and Joseph Smith are on very precarious grounds, and if you're consistent, you would have to abandon not just Hardy's in claims, but even tr many Trinitarian formulations of yeah. Christ and humanity and so forth. Right. Okay. Cool. So uh, we'll move on to like um, DNC A421 between you. Mm hmm. So, but yeah, uh, so far, like uh, a lot of that has made sense so far. Yeah, it has. Yeah, I think um, definitely would be good for people to, if they're listening to this, probably easier if they watch and read. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll upload the uh, I actually uploaded the slides in Dropbox, so I'll send you the link. Uh, so, I, because I have like loads of notes as well in John four twenty four and Genesis one twenty six and twenty seven, like addressing like say some of the other claims, like well, does God have a body? Can he be uh, and so forth? So we won't address it now but like um the entire slideshow actually has these texts as well yeah now, uh, dnc 84 21 to 22 is actually used as the example of latter-day saint scripture 
uh, blown up in the faces of Latter-day Saints, you know, a contradiction with our claims. Um, and without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. Throughout this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Uh, to give an example from the Tanners in their book, More Than Some Shadow of Reality, uh, page 144, the revelation, that is the one that we just read, given in 1832, seems to show that Joseph Smith's storied first vision was made up years after it was supposed to have occurred. Joseph Smith did not even claim to have the priesthood in 1820, and the Doctrine and Covenants clearly states that without the priesthood, no man can see God and live. So according to the DNC, Joseph could not have seen the Father and the Son in 1820. I think that's a very good summary, uh, succinct summary yeah. of the typical argument critics yeah. like, say, Ron Rhodes and others use against Latter-day Saints scripture. Not that they accept the authority of scripture, but even said, like, using your worldview and your presuppositions and your scriptures, it contradicts or undercuts your claims to authority. There's, like, an inconsistency here. So, mm -hmm. um, is there any other way you want to, like, for, uh, maybe nuance the argument, or do you want to proceed? No, I think that pretty much is the argument, and, um, yeah, if, um, you, yeah. if you have to have the authority of the priesthood, or it's the Melchizedek priesthood, it says yeah. in the verse, isn't it? To see, yeah, in context, it's the Melchizedek priesthood. Yeah, to see God the Father. You know, the priesthood wasn't restored until 1829. The first vision was in 1820. So, yeah. therefore, how could Joseph Smith have seen God? And yeah, and to be fair, like, it's a good question. You know, um, you know it's not like based on the straw, and they're not exact. I, I would dispute that the, this is the priesthood. But even though I understand why some people will bring this up as a good text, because it's something that like, the saints have to engage in. It's not like a really crappy argument, like the Adu argument or the Land of Jerusalem argument. So what's going yeah, on? Yeah, no, it's worth looking into. Yeah, yeah. so I, I wanted to look into that one. Yep, yeah, and hopefully this will add free to free thought. So like, there's two good options out there, and they're not actually mutually exclusive. You can actually hold both. It's not like either one or the other. You know? Right. So the one option, and this is the popular option, is this can be answered with the assumption that this, the demonstrative, refers to priesthood, which Joseph Smith being in the pre-mortal existence actually ordained to the priesthood. Uh, now, this is common. Uh, John Taylor in the John Taylor Papers received a revelation. It's not canonized, but it's in the John Paper, uh, John Taylor Papers. Try saying that three times fast. In the Church History Library. And this is a transcription that John Twentness produced, and he's... Uh, it's an underrated book, but it's an excellent book. Uh, it's unheard of in many circles. Organized my kingdom. Uh, John was like an Asian Near Eastern scholar, did a lot of great work in the Book of Mormon. He actually wrote a very good history of the uh, priesthood. Um, so if anyone wants a good, if now in light of J.S. Pepper's slightly dated book on the priesthood and the development of offices, this is actually a good one. But this is what um, John Taylor wrote in uh, Revelation, June 27th, so the anniversary of the martyrdom, 1882. Behold, I raise up my servant Joseph to introduce my gospel and to build up my church and establish my kingdom on earth. I have unto him wisdom and knowledge and revelation and intelligence pertaining to the past, the present, and the future, even to that extent which was not known among men. And I downed him with power from on high and confirmed upon him the priest of Aaron and also of Melchizedek, which is after the order of the Son of God, even the flowiest of all, and after all the power of an endless life and administered forever in the world and the world to come. He was called and ordained to this office before the world was. He was called by me and empowered by me and sustained by me to introduce and establish my church and kingdom upon the earth and to be a prophet, seer, and revelator to my church and kingdom and to be a ruler over Israel. So, according to this text, which I know it's not canonical, but it's part of the uh, John Taylor's uh, revelations and it kind of indicates at least a um, understanding of Joseph in his pre-mortal condition, Joseph was actually ordained and confirmed, uh, had the priesthood confirmed upon them in the pre-existence. So, and this uh, is different before ordination, like being like, him sort of... Yeah, uh, so it wasn't simply like him being foreordained to a call, and he actually had the well, priesthood confirmed upon him as well. Yeah. So, um, maybe, what, no, some would say, well, why then was he ordained, you know, in the year after? That that would probably have been like when the power and authority of the priesthood was actualized or energized, if you will. You know, the on button was turned on, if you will. But he had the, he had the matter, the material of the priesthood. So, according to John Taylor, you know, he actually received the priesthood in the pre-mortal existence. And he, he wasn't simply foreordained, he was set apart and confirmed and so forth in the pre-mortal existence. You know, and um, Joseph himself did teach that every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world, and this is not every single calling, I've seen loads of LDS think like every single calling and every single uh, word has been ordained. No, it's only to those who administer to the world, like on the global level, uh, was ordained to that very purpose in the Grand Council of Heaven before the world was. I suppose that I was ordained to this very office in that Grand Council, and that's the discourse, uh, 12th of May, 1844, in the handwriting of Thomas Bullock. And you also have this idea of like foreordination in Abraham Tree, 22 to 24. 
I mean, even like even ignoring the de- uh, debate about the uh, dating of Abraham Tree and so forth, uh, this precedes this particular uh, sermon. So he had like say ordination and foreordination and so forth, and even conferral priesthood in the pre-existence is not necessarily like a um, modern apologetic ply. It's actually common in the 19th century. I'm not going to quote this. Uh, this is Orson Pratt in the sermon October 10, 1880. He said something very similar. So for those who want to read it, I'll let you pause. Yeah, it's a long quote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just do it for, because he, he goes into detail here. Yeah. Again, Young says something very similar, October 9, 1859. Again, I'm not going to read it all, but like you can pause and you can look it out for yourself. George Buchanan, uh, December 5, 1869, said the same thing, as did Wilfred mm-hmm. Woodruff, uh, September 12, 1875. And again, George Buchanan, um, when was this? Uh, October 29, 1882. Now, the reason for this is to show this was actually something that was well discussed in the 19th century. It's not like a novelty or like a uh, common or a n- new apologetic uh, argument to answer this objection. This was actually right. known and um, discussed in the 19th century, and this was like a very common understanding. And even Orson Pratt was actually referencing Section 84 to give a discussion about what's going on, and he uses this mm-hmm. kind of apologetic as well. Now, the option number two, and I said these are not mutually exclusive, but this is the one I actually favor. Um, it's not the priesthood, but the power of godliness that's required. So, that's why I said my video as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so just to, uh, the power of godliness uh, is mentioned, and I would argue that the demonstrative of this does not refer to the priesthood. It refers to the power of godliness. And I'm not the... Matthew Brown, uh, I wrote about this, um, but it's not actually a n- new interpretation. Uh, this text, as I argue, is not necessarily stating that one needs to hold the Melchizedek priesthood to be able to see God, the Father, and live. Instead, he's speaking about the power of godliness. As Joseph Smith, like many ancient prophets, was protected by the Holy Spirit, he could endure the presence of the Father. And then there's the text, like section 67, verse 11, For yeah. no man has seen God any time in the flesh, except not be, uh, except he quickened by the Spirit of God, not because he holds the priesthood. Yeah. Also, Moses 1, 2, and 11, the very same thing, and Moses saw God face to face, and he talked with him, and the glory of God was upon Moses, therefore Mo- Moses could endure his presence. But now mine eyes, Moses, have beheld God, but not my natural, but my spiritual eyes. So, again, this harkens back to what we were discussing when it comes to John, as well. For my natural eyes cannot have beheld, for I should have withered and died in his presence, but his glory was upon me, and I beheld his face, for I was transfigured before him. And of course, JST Exodus 33 20 that we read uh, at the start of this presentation that harmonizes what's going on when it comes to that text in the King James. Um, yeah, so that interpretation of um, DNC 84, that that fits in with the other scripture passages that yeah. it's, it's to do with um, the power of godliness being transfigured, you know, exactly. God's spirit quickening you. Um, it's not about having the Melchizedek priesthood. Yeah. Uh, Wilford A. Aston in 1956, so this is like decades ago, uh, teaching the gospel with prayer and testimony. It's basically like a, uh, a, not really an apologetic book, but it's like more like a handbook for like missionaries and others sharing the gospel. It's in this context. Joseph Smith's declaration that he saw God is true and convincing. We mentioned the Stephen story, Acts 7, in connection with the first vision. This is done deliberately to prepare the mind of the investigator to remind him that such visions have occurred. Were not for the fact that it also happens to explain the Godhead, its use would not be justified. Some will say, but the Bible says no man can see God and live. To which the missionary should reply, you're entirely correct, Mr. Tanner. In this kernel stage, no man can see God. This is why God must temporarily change those who behold him and continue with the lesson. So this is like a, uh, an interpretation. Now, of course, he's not addressing section 84. I know that. But mm. the idea, the assumptions are here as well. And this is from 1956. And Joseph Hill McConkey, who was the son of Bruce McConkey, and like his father was um, often very uh, black and white and very um, rigid. Yeah. Um, he was also a friend's mission president uh, in Scotland. Okay. He wrote a uh, he wrote a book, Answers Straightforward Answers to Tough Gospel Questions, uh, page one four seven from nineteen ninety eight, and he actually holds to this interpretation as well. Commenting on these verses, some have suggested that holding the priesthood is a request to seeing God. That such an interpretation was not intended is evident from the verses that follow. Now, this Moses plainly taught in the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore, the Lord in his rash, for his anger was killed against him, swore that they should not enter into his rest, while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Therefore, he took Moses out of their midst in the holy priesthood. And that's verses 23 to 25. And then he offers this commentary. Moses was not speaking to sanctify only the men any more than he intended to lead the men without the wives and children into the promised land. All were to be sanctified so that men, women, and children could stand in the presence of their God and all were 
to journey together in the land promised to them. The story typifies the whole system of salvation and our, and our sojourn in mortality. We make the journey to our land a promise eternal life as families. All must be sanctified, for no unclean thing can enter the divine presence. There is no suggestion here that men alone are to be saved, or that they alone are to enjoy the blessings of obedience to sacred ordinances. Those blessings take on meaning only as husband and wife stand side by side, and then are surrounded by their posterity. When the revelation says, for without this no man can see the face of God and the Father and live, the antecedent of this is the power of godliness, or being sanctified. The ordinance is the priesthood out of which the power of godliness comes, bring the same promise of blessings to women than they do to men. Okay. So um, those those scriptures um, in DNC 84 uh, talk to the children of Israel in the wilderness to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. That's referring to uh, women as well as men. And um, at, at this point, would they have... Um, not have the Melchizedek priesthood also? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Did your mic go? Okay. Um, may yeah, I... I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry about that. It's just the microphone. I can talk again. Oh, you're okay. So um, so those pa that passage that says that Moses taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness, so that's the men and the women, I suppose the children as well, maybe. Yeah, it seems to be pretty as well. uh, inclusive, yeah. Yeah, if they sanctified, um, if they tried to sanctify themselves, that they could behold the face of God. So it wasn't just exclusive to the men. So it, therefore, you don't need the Melchizedek priesthood to see God. And at that stage, was the Melchizedek priesthood withdrawn? At well, it says in section 84, it was taken away, but we do know that there was like some people who did have it, so... How to harmonize what that says with the rest of the uh, scriptures is that it was only there in very limited uh, numbers. Oh, okay. The main priesthood, because of their disobedience, was the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. Because okay. we do know, like, say, Lehi held the priesthood, but he was not a Levite. We know Jeremiah held the priesthood, but he was not a Levite as well. So there was always, like, a line of people in some way or another, for whatever reason, held a different priesthood. And we would say that was the Melchizedek. Oh, right, even though they weren't from the tribe of Levi. Okay, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, for instance, like, uh, Moses' father-in-law is referred to as a priest, and if he uses the technical term, a Kohen, um, not, some, uh, not a Kohen, which is often, not always so often used for an idolatrous or a false priest, he's the term Kohen, which is actually the same term for Melchizedek. Um, you know, in Exodus 18, so we do know that there were other priests even contemporary with Moses. Who were called of God, and also Melchizedek himself, who was not a um, uh, Levite or um, so forth. Okay. And we also there were other priests as well, like Jeremiah, uh, David uh, engaged in priestly activity, as did Solomon in the um, temple, but they weren't uh, priests of Aaron. So. Okay, that's grand. Cool. Um, and this is actually something one also finds. Uh, in early Christian literature. Uh, there's what's called the pseudo Clementine homilies. It claims to be written by Clement of Rome, the author of one Clement, but it wasn't. But, um, at the same time, scholars believe this is like just before Nicaea, so 300 to 300. For I maintain that the eyes of mortals cannot see the incorporeal form of the Father, her Son, because it is illumined by exceeding great light. For he who sees God cannot live. For the excess of light solves the flesh of him who sees. Unless by the secret power of God the flesh can be changed in the nature of life, so that can see life. Again, this is something that is pretty harmonious with what we have when it comes to just its revelations and theology mm. of uh, God. And as you would also argue, he considered understanding what the Bible, when taken as a whole, says about the issue as well. It also makes me think of the scripture in Timothy about the unapproachable light, and then saying that it, the excess of the light will dissolve the flesh of him who sees as well. Unless first there's a special barrier or some kind of intervention, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, this is a text, I've only seen one other Latter-day Saint apologist appeal to, but it's a rather interesting text. It's a Coptic text just before the 5th century. So, yeah, it's late, but it's still, um, it captures the same train of thought that you find in uniquely Latter-day Saint scripture. And this is from the Bourbon Strasbourg Apocryphal in chapter 7. Um, Three days shall I take you to heaven with me to instruct you about the things that you desire to see, so do not be disturbed when you see me. And this is Jesus speaking. He said to him, Lord, in what form will you appear to us? In what kind of body will you come? Tell us. John spoke up and said, Lord, when you come to us, do not reveal yourself to us in all of your glory. And turn your glory into another glory, so we may be able to bear it, lest you will see and despair because of fear. The Savior answered, I shall take away from you the fear that you are afraid of, so that you might see and believe. But do not touch me until I go up to my Father, who is in 
who is your father, my God, who is your God, and my Lord, who is your Lord. If someone approaches me, he will burn. I'm the fire that blazes. The one who is close to me is close to the fire. That one who is far from me is far from life. So they beg, look, we want to see your glory, but not your full glory. Like, uh, maybe if you look like you uh, show sure, some glory, so we can actually approach you, you know, and... Um, <laughs> So again, this is like what you find in ex yeah, this is something similar to what you find in Exodus, something you find in uniquely Latter-day Saint scripture. It's it's pretty consistent. And I'm not saying this proves Latter-day Saint theology, this proves that the early Christians were proto Mormon. But this showed like even early Christianity, and this is after the yes, Council of Nicaea, and also because it's complete after the Catholic Church broke from the Orthodox uh, body over Chalcedon, this is still a strand of thought that's accepted and understood in, at least in some Christian circles. It's not a novelty or a desperate attempt by, say, fundamentalists or conservative Latter-day Saints like myself to explain the biblical data and for Joseph Smith as well as try to explain the biblical data and try to show a greater level of unity or consistency among biblical authors themselves. Uh, another thought, this is sort of connected, but um, can't remember which account is of the first vision, maybe 1832, but doesn't he replace the word a pillar of fire with Pillar of Light, or... Yeah, I think that's actually the 1832 or... account. It's, uh, yeah. it's one of the early ones where uh, pillar, and, pillar of Light and Pillar of Fire uh, runs around over the other, but uh, yeah. Yeah, they're almost like synonymous in a way, but maybe thought Light was a better way to describe it, but that's interesting. Yeah. Um, now, um, we have... Now, I'm kind of like we're going on, so I'm going to like briefly discuss Stephen's vision in Act 7. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be very brief. Now, in Acts 7, and this is a text in terms of really used, uh, but Stephen being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up, steadfast into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That's 7, 59 to 56. Yeah. And um, maybe, um, you served the missions, like, um, you know, if Elder Murphy was here, you know, while he was serving in Canada, how would you actually use this text? Uh, I would have used that, that um, he, he looked up, and he saw, he saw God, um, although it says the glory of God, I just would have said he saw God and Jesus on his right hand. Um, so therefore he saw God and Jesus, so man can see God. Yeah, so like, um, yeah, and that's true. Like, Larry Day St. Jesus as well to show that God the Father has a body because, yeah, he sees the glory of God in verse 55, but then Jesus is on his right hand side, which would indicate uh, there's a right hand side to God. So he's localized and he also has some type of form that you can see. That's his back parts, that's his face, and that's his arms. Yeah. So uh, some claim right hand is actually a metaphor. Now, it is true, right hand can be used as a metaphor. For instance, um, not to get into politics, but like you could say like, um, uh, the Vice President of America is the uh, right hand woman, well, yeah. woman, if you will, of yeah. the President. Um, you know. yeah. So it can be used, and even in the Bible, it is used in a metaphorical sense. We see an example of this from John Damascene, who's like, um, a very heavy hitter in uh, Orthodox theology. He's a canonized saint in both Catholic and Roman Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox traditions, and he's from about the 7th century. And if you ever study, like, say, that era, especially, like, the development of icon veneration, you'll come across him. Um, he's a uh, very important figure, and you see an example of this. I won't read it, but you can pause it and read it, of an early, no, late uh, Christian using this uh, in a metaphorical sense. Okay. Uh, right -handed. Now, there's a couple things wrong with claiming, well, there's biblical examples of right hand being used metaphorically. Ergo, Acts 7 is metaphorical. Um, not at least, it's the fallacy um, called undisputed middle. An example of this would be the first premise. There are some instances of right hand in the Bible that are metaphorical. Second premise, right hand is used in Acts 7, 55 and 56. Conclusion, therefore, the use of the term right hand is metaphorical in Acts 7, 55 to 56. Or to give an example of this, uh, first premise, the person I'm talking to is from Northern Ireland. Second premise, Sean is a very common male name in Northern Ireland. Conclusion, his name must be Sean. Hi. And now, uh, the pre indicates in both major and minor premises cannot exhaust all the occurrences. You're basically you're working from very limited data. Like, right. there's some instances of this. You cannot claim, ergo, in this context, it must mean that. And most you could say, could be metaphorical. Right, so you can't say it matter of fact. You can't yeah. say it's definitely matter of fact. Yeah, as I know here, like a more non dogmatic and accurate conclusion would be that Acts seven fifty five to fifty six, ignoring other considerations, could have a metaphorical meaning. But okay. such should be said with much caution, as the argument for such a meaning is not nearly as simplistic as critics would like it to be. Right. Now it's true that the term interpretation. 
is what you're saying, but it, there's also other references. Yeah, to it, it's being... on its own without looking at other considerations. If possible, it can be metaphorical. Mm. But you have to look at other occurrences and the context. So as I note here, it's true that the term can be used in the sense of authority, like a heresy of Biden's right-hand man, if you're into U.S. politics, or right-hand woman to be a bit more correct, although the left can tell us what a woman is. However, the claim that this is how it is to be interpreted in Acts 7, 55 to 56 is Isis Jesus, i.e. reading into something, that, something that's out there. And to give an example of LDS Isis Jesus uh, claiming I, Ezekiel 37 is a direct prophecy in the Book of Mormon, it's reading something in there that's not there. Uh, so I'm not just talking about LDS here. Yeah. Isis Jesus doesn't actually have anything to do with Jesus. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I actually have a very nice mature student in my uh, university course. You know, first time she heard Isis Jesus, she actually bowed her head because she thought the lecture was talking about our Lord. But um, because of me, uh, this passage is describing what Stephen saw in a vision. It's not political, it's actually a historical narrative, and that's important. Uh, yeah, that, not, that is, that's the context. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a metaphor for the relationship Jesus has with the Father. No, vis a vis at her. Uh, to give an example, um, if you were to say to your lovely wife, you're the apple of my eye, does that mean that apple, in its normative sense, refers to a metaphor? No, it, um, that's an extraordinary use of the term. Apple is actually, in its normal sense, a physical, real thing. So it agree with like a historical narratives. So like, uh, say, like the very first time you use apple, you use it like to serenade your wife on Valentine, saying like, you know, so-and-so, you're the apple in my eye. And then you read your diary, like, today I am an apple. It would be stupid for me to claim, oh, he likes to cannibal, uh, he um, cannibalize his wife or something like that. It's it's absurd. It needs to be absurd. Okay, okay, so it's a historical narrative, and that's important. Uh, and also it says that Stephen looked up and saw, doesn't it? Yeah. Like he saw it. Yeah, yeah, as I said, it's a historical vision. He's describing what he saw in vision. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a metaphor, it's, it's not poetic in context. And also what's been described is what's called the spatial relationship between the father and son. Mm -hmm. But not the metaphorical relationship in terms of eternity or something like that. Now, those who critique the latter recent understanding have to ignore the literary genre, historical narrative of this pericope. And a pericope is just the fancy theological term for a self-contained unit of text. Furthermore, the author of Acts 7, 55 to 56 is actually alluding to a messianic text from the Old Testament, Psalm 110 verse 1, or in the Septuagint, 109 verse 1. Now, this is the uh, Septuagint, um, you know, to in Samos Epinocurias to Curiamu, Catron Ectexonu, Yosa Antutus, Atrusu, Epipondion Don Podonsu. And a translation, don't worry, we're not just working in Greek, Psalm of David and Lord said to my Lord, my curio said to my curio, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, this is a very common text you'll yeah. find when it comes to JWs, and that's a different matter. But here in this text, there's David is speaking, and he's, see, he's talking about one Lord and another Lord. One Lord who's on the right hand of the Lord, and he's exalted, and it's a vision, yeah. and so forth. And this is like the most alluded to, or quoted from text, apart from, the, from maybe Daniel 7, 13, the Son of Man text. Um, you know, and Jesus actually uses this text in Mark, 7, Mark 12 to Solon's objections to his nature and his character from his uh, opponents. It's a really important f passage. But yeah. in this context, and biblical, and this is not just me, this is what biblical scholars, LDS and non LDS, believe. The author of Luke Acts, uh, who's the same author, is actually using in his narrative to describe the vision of Stephen, Psalm 110, verse 1, that speaks of two distinct lords. And one lord is on the right hand, spatially, not simply metaphorically. Of another lord, like right. you have the king and you have the prince regions of you all. That yeah. kind of relationship. So here, the first lord and in Hebrew it's actually Jehovah Yahweh says the second lord, Adam, me, my lord, to sit at his right hand. And this is one of the instances where it's clearly the father who's called Jehovah or Yahweh in the Old Testament in letters. Yes. Uh, the only meaningful and exegetically interpretively sound interpretation of this verse is that the second lord is sitting at the right hand of God. It's not metaphorical, and if there's any metaphor, it's in in addition to, uh, and does not subtract from the historical narrative and the reality of this being a spatial relationship as well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Not that simply yeah. as a man, man, like a vice president of God, metaphorically speaking. Though he does indeed serve as God's vice or vice president, if you will, be sure. And there's other instances in the Bible where right hand or right hand man in some other terms are actually used for spatial relationships. Like in Zechariah 3 1, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan. Stand in his right hand to resist him. I don't think anyone would claim Satan, even if you just think it's a prosecuting attorney angel, let alone like um, old Beelzebub, who's actually 
you know, the right hand man or the vice president of evil of the angel of the Lord. It's a special relationship that's been yeah, discussed. Sounding so there are like, unequivocal instances of right hand being used in a special relationship. Yeah. Uh, another thought that just came to my mind was of the, you know, DNC 76 of the visions of, of the degrees of glory and Joseph and Sidney Rigdon claimed that they saw, you know, Jesus on the right hand of God, and that again was a very anti modalist text on the land, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, which, um, yeah. From seven days. They saw Jesus on his right hand, and. And that's the thing, like, with all due respect to you, uh, Dan Vogel and Palmer and others, like, um, uh, if you watch this, I mean, at Dan, you engage in a lot of gymnastics when it comes to your uh, texts, uh, to preserve yeah. the uh, respectively saying, uh, but yeah, that... I think Grant Palmer tried to argue what you were saying that well, well that could just be a metaphor, not not literal, but it, it doesn't make as much sense if they're seeing it. And this is why I said, like, uh, even only looking at the term right hand and not looking at any other consideration, you could claim it could mean this, but when you look at all the other considerations, its context, its genre, and its allusion to Psalm one ten verse one. It's a spatial relationship. It's not a merely metaphorical relationship at the very least. Yeah. So, and this actually shows uh, God does actually have some kind of spatial relationship. So it's not just Jesus who's embodied. God has a form and shape as well. But also, Stephen saw him. Not simply only his glory. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that then shows, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to quote this, but like an excellent book came out just last year. Uh, the Embodied God Seeing the Divine in Luke Acts in the Early Church by uh, Brittany E. Wilson. And in, um, it's an excellent book um, because it's not just Old Testament scholars who are coming to the idea like God is essentially three dimensional and bodily. A growing number of New Testament scholars are actually coming to the same conclusions uh, as well. And she actually discusses this in light of Stephen's vision. And she basically argues with some qualification God is clearly being depicted in anthropomorphic, i.e., bodily form. Um, it's not simply like um, any metaphor or anything like that, and a lot of people go through these slides. You can download them, you can look at them, um, and she does say, there, there is some ambiguity, but like, for instance, she claims Daniel 7, 13, but also compare Psalm 110, verse 1 as well. This is one of the key texts to understand what's going on here in this uh, vision. And there's other texts as well that actually say God can be seen, even in what's called the intertestamental period. Not Enoch. Uh, you know, in chapter 14, verses 15 to 25, that she referenced as well. And uh, this would be about uh, the 2nd century BC to the 1st century AD, so something very contemporary with the uh, New Testament. In fact, Jude, the half brother of Jesus in his book um, of the New Testament, actually quotes from Mount well, Enoch. So the biblical authors at least were familiar with and sometimes even conversant with this particular book. Uh, and fragments of which were also found at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scroll community as well. And there's other texts as well. This is a commentary on the same passage for those who want to delve more into it. But for me, when it comes to say the nature of God having three-dimensional form and bodily form, I've learned a lot about this uh, for something that's free online. Then well during versus latter day saying the biblical theology and divine embodiment, I go through all the relevant texts, like Genesis 1, 3, 6 to 3, 7, that let us make man in their image text. Hebrews 1, 3, that says that Christ is the um, same opagasma. Uh, as the Father and so forth, you know, John 4.24, the uh, God is a spirit text and other related texts as well, so, and also in these, I, I have the appendix, check out. Yeah. and also the appendix on these slides, uh, I have material on John 4.24 and Luke 3.4.29, I'm just going to do the kind of go into detail about what's going on, but also John Day, who I referenced earlier on Hosea and the Baal cult in uh, Elohim, he's written two excellent essays and two books on Genesis 1-11, and he basically comes to the same conclusion as Latter day Saints do when it comes to the interpretation of Genesis 1. It's treat the image and likeness is not merely metaphorical. It's not merely like that of man's domain over uh, animal creation and so forth. Yeah. It's actually a tr God, man being in the same image three dimensionally as God, which means yeah. God, according to the author of this past particular text, is embodied, has body form, and is three dimensional. And he goes through like the Hebrew and stuff like that, some of which he's here and some of which I reproduce on my blog post. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's the that's the other side. I know it's been very lengthy and a lot of uh, new information, but uh, I hope... Searching there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when it comes to, say, the nature of God and stuff like that, um, it's something I feel very strongly about. I love discussing Christology, but I also realize... Yeah. Uh, there have, when I started studying the church, and even when I got involved in apologetics, you know, um, there's been some good biblical discussions about that releasing theology, like my friend Dick Oster and Matthew Bowen and Stephen Smooch, but I also know it's like there's a lot of gaps in the Kuna when it comes to, say, nowadays interaction with scholarship and 
Christology and God. So hopefully in some way or another in my blog and other writings and even in this presentation I've kind of helped um, push the envelope and kind of shows like there's other areas like uh, we do as a theology excel at over other theologies and biblically and theologically and consistently in terms of logic it's much better than like even a lot of numerous uh, literature is believed to be. Um, so. Okay, that's good. That's awesome. Uh, I, I know you mentioned at the start, um, is, there's nothing else you want to say on um, on this topic, Command C Go. I think we covered it very thoroughly. All, all I would say is, like, um, although unfortunately a lot of the books are pretty expensive, um, you can get them on interlibrary loan, there is a growing body of scholars, not just godless liberals, you know, who believe in the documentary hypothesis, not that believing in the documentary hypothesis is liberal. I, I lean towards that way myself. But, you know, not just like atheist scholars who hate the Bible. But there's a growing level of scholarship uh, from all perspectives that are coming to realize that the earliest or they call primitive understandings of God in the Bible is that of an anthropomorphic deity. And yeah. that God can be seen with qualifications and so forth. So this is an area where, at the very least, when it comes to saying the nature of God, the counsel of God, and even Christology, and I would love to discuss Christology with you sometime and other things like that, and the pros and cons of Trinitarian and other theologies. This is something where Latter-day Saints, not just on an exegetical level when it comes to the biblical data, but even the scholarly literature, it's coming more and more in line with what we view about the nature of God and the divine counsel and many other things as well. So I um, would like, urge anyone to like look at the relevant scholarship like Esther Hamery's book when Gods Were Men and um, Richmond Summers book The Bodies of God and World Ancient Israel and even the uh, Wilson book I referenced as well, which is an excellent treatment of God and embodiment in Luke Acts. Um, not just the old Testament. That's awesome. Yeah, well, we'll definitely make sure that we put a lot of, like links in the description uh, of what we went through. I know you said at the start that you wanted to um, touch on sort of like into our modalism discussion, uh, the lectures on faith. Um, yeah, I have like that. maybe like 10 slides. I'll be very brief. But, uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, this is sort of in response to Dan Vogel, if I'm correct. You just want to uh, that is correct. Um, can you see the slides? I can, yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. Let me just like try to um, maximize them here. Okay. Well, a few weeks ago, you kindly had me on the show and we discussed like what's early priorities in Christology out of modals, i.e. father and son are numerically one and same person. There's just different modes or manifestations of the one same person. That's the TLD. Yeah, and, and usually the lectures on faith aren't really considered a modal. Yeah. Passage. Yeah, you should, yeah. Critics, in my understanding. That, um, that is true. Usually they're shown like um, that the shared mind of the Godhead was the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit was not considered a distinct person. Is and, that bi-Trinitarianism? Is that the correct bi Binitarianism. Um, Binitarian, okay. Binitarian. Yeah, um, my friend uh, Josh Gailey, he's a member of the, they're called the Bikronites, but, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, they would actually appeal to this to show that early Latter-day Saint Christology, at least that the recognized flavor, was Binitarian. And they're actually Binitarian themselves. So, um, we actually had a very nice discussion about his theology, which was informed not in full, but uh, in part by Rinton and his theology and so forth. So, if you want to look at Binitarian is pretty much similar to Trinitarian, but by is in two. Just the yeah, yeah. Like usually that. they don't believe in the personality of the Holy Spirit, and if they do, that he's a lesser deity. But the typical Binitarian view is like the Father, Son, are divine persons, but they would believe they would have a very Unitarian understanding of the Holy Spirit, not a person, but very personal. God's activity spiritually and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. There's different flavors of that, but that would be like the basic gist of Binitarianism. So it's basically two thirds Trinitarianism, if you will. Um, so, and I would say that's a better view and better approach than it contains strands and what. Yeah, I think that would have been like Grand Palmer's. Yeah, um, and, and that's the like, I understand why in your video you'd not raise that, and I don't bring it up, but I kind of realized like, maybe we should discuss it just to be as full as possible, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, this is very brief, like, is lecture on fate number five consistent with modalism? I would say it's consistent more with binitarianism, but binitarianism undercuts modalism because there's still a distinction of person between the following. Yeah. yeah, they're quite different. Yeah, oh, yeah, they are. Um, now, right. Dan Vogel on lecture on fate number five, and this is from Justice Smith's First Vision Burn one on his uh, YouTube channel. However, while the lecture, i.e. number five, describes the son as a personage of flesh, it nevertheless fails to define the person, the son as a person. So notice, yeah, uh, he tries to make a distinction between personage and person in terms of meaning, distinct right. from the father, and therefore it may only be a variation of modalism, albeit one that would allow for the simultaneous appearance of the father and son. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, there's no nice way of saying this, but I'll try my uh, way to be nice. This is absurd. Um, 
then basically you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. It's like whenever default and descent are distinct from one another, well, you know, that's just like modalism, but like uh, for some reason, uh, just simultaneous appearances of the same person, like multi-location of a body and stuff like that, it, it's pretty absurd. Um, the closest thing I know in like the scholarly literature that uh, argues for this is like an essay by uh, Brian Leftow, Models Without Modalism. At least you got as a single person, but because he exists outside of time, that same person can exist in different modes or in spaces at the same reference of time. It's it's kind of odd, but that's the closest thing I've ever come across in the scholarly literature to someone advocating this understanding of Trinitarianism and modalism. But uh, Dan is actually wrong in a number of uh, points. Uh, for instance, uh, the lecture faith makes a numerical distinction of the persons of the Father and Son. For instance, how many personages are there in the garden? And we'll address personage momentarily to the Father and Son. How do you prove that there are two personages of God and of uh, personages in the Godhead? And notice here, he references Genesis 1.26, Genesis 3.22, and John 17.5. All make a distinction of person between the Father and Son. Genesis 1.26, which is not quoted here, is like, let's make man in our image and in our likeness, plural pronouns mm. in the English translation. Then references Moses, which is a reworking of Genesis 1.26, and the Lord God said unto the only begotten who was with him from the beginning, so two different persons, but one was with the other, not that one was the other or a different manifestation of the other. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, again, plural pronouns, plural persons, and it was done. Genesis 3.22, And the Lord God said unto the only begotten, Behold, a man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And this is like Moses, but like a reworking as well. Uh, and John 17.5, And now, O Father, glorify thou uh, me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is Christ's intercessory prayer. He is on earth, the Father is in heaven. The Father has glory. The Son has stripped himself of glory to come to the earth. He has to be glorified by a distinct person. Again, this is why John's gospel is so antithetical to modalism and Vogel's responses as, well, modalists still believe in the gospel of John and still appeal to the gospel of John is, is a dodge. Um, these are, and these are the texts used in the lectures of faith to substantiate what they mean by two personages in the Godhead. Do you understand that? Two diff distinct yeah, persons. so the fact that they're sort of like referring to these, these passages, these are not these are not modalistic passages. These are not by any stretch of the imagination. At, at, at worst, for an Irish apologist like myself, they're binitarian. Yeah, yeah, not, okay. not modalist. I agree. Yeah. Now um, there are other passages as well. For instance, and this is section two because if you look at the uh, previous one, it references as well section two. So what does section two say? There are two personages who constitute the great matches governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made that are created whether visible and invisible, whether in heaven or in earth, or, um, under the earth or throughout the immensity of space. They, plural pronoun, are the Father and the Son. The, person, the Father being the personage of spirit, glory, and power, possessing all perfection and fullness. The Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, the personage of tabernacle, made or fashioned like unto man, or being in the form and likeness of man, or rather, man was formed after his likeness and his image. He is also the express image and likeness of the personage of the Father. So does only make sense if he's a distinct person, because how can the same person be a distinct personage? and uh, the Father, and also be made in his likeness, and after his image. That, again, of course, I know how Dan will argue, you know, simultaneous appearances of the same uh, person, but that doesn't make any sense to any plain reading of the text. He is also the expressed image and likeness of the person, the Father, personage of the Father, I should say, possessing all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father, being begotten of him, and was ordained before the foundation of the world to be a propitiation for the sins of all those who should believe on his name. And I'll pause here. This alone undercuts Vogel and the Bible's theory. To be a propitiation, that means to appease the anger of someone. Jesus appeases the anger, not of himself, but of the Father in his atonement and his intercession. Yeah. Something we also address when it came to say yes. section 45 of the Doctrine of the Covenants. Right. And also, notice here, he's made in the image and likeness of the Father. The Father is not made in the image and likeness of the Son. Mm -hmm. So again, numerically distinct persons, not a modalist uh, uh, manifestation here. Right. You know, and also he's called the son because the flesh and descended in suffering, which the father did not do, the father did not descend in suffering, uh, appeals to Moses, Mosiah 15, notwithstanding, that which man can suffer under worlds, suffered great sufferings and was exposed to more powerful contradictions than any man can be. But in the same all this, he kept the law of God and remained without sin. And you now some will say, well, you know, election fights five says that the father and son share the same mind. So that means that they're the same person. However, in the very same lecture, no, it does. It does say they share the same mind. That's true. However, so isn't, isn't the Holy Ghost? Is it referred to as the mind of God in the yeah, yeah. as well? 
But yeah, that's true. Like, here's the thing. Glorified Christians are also said to actually be partakers and to share the same mind of the Father and Son when they're glorified, which would indicate, unless you're saying the thing, everyone will become a manifestation of God, and God is going to be like billions or trillions of people, well, uh, modes in one person. This is not what, this is not a modalist teaching, because all who believe on his name and keep his commandments, and all those who keep his commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom, joint heirs of Christ, possessing the same mind, yeah. being transformed in the same image or likeness, even the express image of him who fills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. So, if one appeals to the same mind text, uh, one will have to, if you're consistent claim, well, this means in our, in, at least in the theology of Lecture in Fate 5, everyone will become united in the singular person of God and become God manifestations in a modalist understanding, which is absurd. Uh, it's yeah. Father and Son sharing the same mind is not modalism. It's okay. in context. So, some little thing, uh, and also in Lecture in Fate 5, it says they, the Father and Son, so plural pronouns, are just and holy beings. So one can find both personages and we'll address personages oh, later. Here, yeah. they're plural beings, and this plural beings is coupled with a plural verb and pronouns. They are not he is manifestations or something like that. So again, yeah. just basic English would actually indicate that. And I'm not saying like lecture and faith five is consistent with modern Latter-day Saint theology or even what's called Nauvoo theology. I believe that. Uh, there are contradictions. Um, I believe there's a received explicit revelation that would go against I mean, some of the assumptions. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I'll have to admit that. I, mean, I think it's about. exaggerated a bit, but like, uh, for instance, you're not going to find the personality of the Holy Spirit in this, but at the same time, it's not modalism. A barrier yeah. case would be, it's binitarianism, mm -hmm. but the problem though is, if it's binitarian, you just undercut yourself when you claim, at least in 1835, there's a radical shift already from one person in the Godhead to t at least two. Yeah, so, so pretty much... The lectures on faith from what we've looked through it is uh not modalism you could not be by any stretch of imagination also um what what did personage mean in the 1828 like this is from webster's 1828 dictionary it meant basically more or less the same thing as a person like exterior appearance statue uh stature i should say air as tall per, as a tall personage a stately personage so it yeah. refers to a person, like it could be like a role, like um, the president of the USA is a personage of the um, US government, but still not like a mobilistic manifestation. Um, this is how it's used in works, like uh, this is like portraits of illustrious personages of Great Britain, uh, volume 70s in 1835, and this is from the uh, first of the few pages of the Tebow Commons from the 1825 edition, or volume I should say, so it's contrary from what the lectures in fate. William, so who are these personages? William II, Duke of Hamilton, James Stanley, Earl of Derby, Francis Lord Coddington. These are personages, but they're not the same person in a modalist understanding. They're different persons and personages. You know, this is how it's used in the contemporary literature. You have another example from 1834, Volume 1 of Collections Upon the Lives of the Reformers, uh, The Treasure, Personage of Kurt and there's like uh, the personage of Calder and uh, Mockland, the Archdeanery personage of Peebles and Manor, you know, the personage of New Bottle. Uh, these are like, you know, the words and ladies and stuff like that, but they're still personages. Does that mean like uh, this particular person actually understood or could be understood as teaching that these are the same, numerically the one same person, just different modalist manifestations of the same person? It's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I only know this. This is from my friend Blake Oster. He actually gives an overview. Now, Blake is much more favorable towards the lectures and faith than I am. Um, now, I do believe everyone should read the lectures and faith. They're of historical value. And there's a lot of very good stuff about faith and uh, reasoning in them. So they're not worthless. But I do believe the nature of God is contrary to modern Latter-day Saints' understandings of God. And I'm comfortable with saying that because I have no problem with St. Joseph and Sidney acting as Joseph and Sidney. Uh, Sidney working from the limited knowledge that they had, you know, uh, before, like, the reception of many things, you know. I do believe yeah. there's a natural development to many aspects of LDS theology. Uh, but, you know, the lectures of faith are still important, so this is from uh, Volume 1 of these uh, four volumes, hopefully soon to be five, it's more and more in thought series, uh, called The Attributes of God. The lectures yeah. also established the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or one Godhead, constituted the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made, 5-2 which we quoted a bit more fuller previously. Thus, the attributes of Godliness do not necessarily define the individual divine persons, rather, they are properties of the Godhead as a unity of persons. 
Many of the lectures teach that he's in virtue of the oneness or unity of the divine persons, that they have the divine attributes. It's very similar to St. John 17 and other passages. The glory which the Father and the Son have is because they are just and holy beings, and that if they are lacking in one attribute or perfection which they have, the glory which they have can never be enjoyed by them, for it requires them to be precisely what they are in order to enjoy it. And if the Savior gives his glory to others, he must do it in the very same way set forth in his prayer to his Father. So, notice here, like, just as the Father, Jesus gives us the believers, the Father gives us the Son. So, what, what's the outcome here? Inconsistent. Just as the believers are distinct from Jesus, Jesus is just as distinct to the Father. But making them one with him, as he and the Father are one. In so doing, he would give them the glory which the Father has given him. And when his disciples are made one with the Father and the Son, as the Father and the Son are one, you cannot see the prop. Uh, propriety of the Savior, saying, The works which I do shall they do, and greater works than these shall they do, because I go to the Father. And that's the from faith 7 15. Thus, the attributes of God arise in the of the relationship of unity enjoyed by the individual divine persons, only when united as one in the Godhead. Each of these attributes and perfections of characters deemed by the lectures be essential divine glory and status. However, the attributes are essential not in virtue of some logical necessity, but a necessity to allow any rational being to exercise faith. For the very glory that God enjoins, enjoys in virtue of possessing such attributes is communicable to humans when they enter divine unity. Now, that doesn't just address the mobilist issue, but like it's a very good summary of the theology one finds in the Christology one finds in the lectures and faith. So I thought yeah. I would include that as the uh, final slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that, that's a good summary. It's kind of like uh, debunking that the lectures on faith are yeah. realistic. And um, okay. I'll also say this uh, Dan Vogel. Dan, Dan has done a lot of good work. Like his five volume work, Early Modern Documents, is a great source. I have my print copies there. I use them for work all the time. They're indispensable. Yeah. But he has been making this claim for decades now. And, um, you know, if he ever wants to have like a moderate debate, maybe at the next fair conference or the Mormon History Association or something like that, um, he can consider this like an open debate challenge. Um, and mm. if, he's wonder, if, he's, if he's worried about my character, ask Dan Peterson, ask Big Oster. One, I'm probably one of the best LDS apologists on the issue of Christology, and that's not boasting, it's just, that's the case. And two, I'm more than willing to actually, I will behave myself in the debate. But he has been making this claim for decades. I think, in light of the historical documents and the scriptural texts and other data, it's absurd. And he can consider this like an open debate challenge, have a dialogue, if he doesn't even want to debate, on the thesis he's been holding for a number of decades now. Yeah. So, no, I think that's fair enough. Without, so if you, without yeah, going so. down a, another tangent, I just wanted to follow up with um, some people might say, okay, maybe Joe Smith wasn't a modalist, but maybe he had a Trinitarian or bi-Trinitarian view of God up until, you know, uh, the mid to late 1830s, and then it evolved into oh, separate beings. I don't see that as problematic, because um, if he saw two separate beings if, or personages, it may not... He may have not thought of that inconsistent with um, the Trinity, but what's your sort of take on that? Because whenever I quoted a lot of those scriptures, um, I did a separate video and some people said, well, it still not necessarily disproves the Trinity. And I was like, yeah, I guess they're kind of right because it doesn't explicitly say separate being separate gods, so to speak. Well, actually, in the Book of Mormon, that it references to God the Father as a being and stuff like that, like in Mormon's Lament, in the Book of Mormon, the small case Book of Mormon, and mm -hmm. well. And sometimes the Father is called God, and yeah. see the distinction from, like, say, Jesus and so forth, and that's actually inconsistent with the Trinity. Um, yeah, my friend, I, Stephen, I, my, my friend Stephen Smith has a paper, and he's actually going to be expanding upon it at the next, I think, the next Sydney Sperry Symposium, but he's going to be arguing, and he's, I think he's correct that the Christology one finds in the Book of Mormon is actually Trinitarian, but it's not creedal Trinitarian. It's called social Trinitarian. Now, I'm not saying like it's the same social Trinitarianism as like, some Eastern Orthodox scholars hold to. It's a Mormonized, if you will, social Trinitarianism. But that but it basically means like, God, there is one God in the sense like um, the Father because he's the source, he's author chaos, he's the source of Christ's divinity because the unity they have with one another and so forth. So there's like one God, the Father, you know, as something you find all through the New Testament. But there's also one God in sort of like, say, the uh, perichoretic or the dancing together, you know, that kind of unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they're still numerically, and in a real sense, distinct persons from one another. Yeah, yeah. That's not tolerating what, and if you ever want to discuss, like, say, the Latin and the Eastern Orthodox understanding, say, person and being and Trinity, it, it would be a bit complex to uh, unpack here, but, um, 
the book of Mormon, I would say, is pretty consistent with some type of, um, albeit qualified social trinitarianism, where mm. uh, the Godhead is similar to, like, say, a, um, not a football team, because that kind of undercut, that's a very weak understanding, let's say, the, uh, the unity they have. But um, I like what Blake Oster does, like, um, the analogy, it's not really a football team, but, like, imagine you have, like, a poker and you put it into your fire, and it's now warm. Um, it's not fire, you know, but it's like, um, it's because of that unity of the objects working together that produces kind of this flame, and in the same way, it's this kind of unity that produces the divinity and the godhead and so forth. You know, it's, uh, he, he basically does a very good job in his third volume. Yeah. But I would argue, um, if you want to like, have a fuller discussion sometime, it is a form of social Trinitarianism that's in view. Yeah. But there's many things in the Book of Mormon, funny enough, that goes against traditional um, Trinitarian theology, not simply modalism. Like, uh, God is often referred to as a being. And it's often in context a person of the Godhead is referred to as a being, which is antithetical to Trinitarian theology because the being of God is the Godhead, if you will, or what makes the Godhead or the Trinity the Trinity. Um, sometimes God, the Father, is referred to as God, and he's distinct from someone else. So it's not simply the Father and Son, it's God and the Son. And a distinction of persons in the Trinity, the distinction of the Father and the Son is in a, in a ambiguous way tolerated, but the distinction between divine title or divine name goes here. And one of the persons is not. It's a bit of a technical point, but there's many things that, when read in whole, it goes against uh, a um, yeah. traditional Latin, not just simply the misunderstood idea, which is basically modalism, but like an Eastern Latin view. Yeah. It, it's basically similar to what you find in the Gospel of John, that kind of oneness of God and so forth. Because, like, uh, Turn Nephi is um, very Johannine as well as Matthean in its understanding of Christ. Um, you know. Yeah. And I, th I think, um, you know, from what we've done in the videos, from my looking at sort of like a lot of the scriptures and the revelations in sort of totality, I see Joseph Smith, there's so much um, teaching that he saw them as separate and distinct, whether or not he saw them as multiple, you know, separate gods. I don't think he was teaching plurality of gods from what yeah, I and looked into explicitly until later on, but I don't see that as problematic um, with regards to his first vision. Yeah, and, so, well, and also, like, when it comes to Joseph Smith, you have to understand, he, yeah, I do believe it was the translator of a text, you know, and so forth. Like, um, in the very first episode, you asked, like, if I was a believing member of the church, and, like, how far I took it, and it's like, I'm pretty orthodox when it comes to these things. Even then, Joseph was still an, a learner and still a reader of the Book of Mormon. I don't believe somebody because he translated it, he understood it. I don't think he was actually a very competent reader in the Book of Mormon, so, um, uh, when it comes to, say, interpreting it as well. Like, um, he was all over the place when it comes to its geography. He was all over the place at time. So I don't, I have no problem with him, like, not getting, not understanding the Book of Mormon and its implications, or, like, other implications of some of the revelations he received. But funny enough, when it comes to the plurality of gods, you may know this. Initially, Joseph, uh, when he was working through the, uh, the Joseph Smith Translation Project, he was removing or downplaying references to plurality of gods. For instance, in the X to 7 text, um, Moses is not Elohim or God, he's actually a prophet or something like that to um, Pharaoh and stuff like that. But it seems like he was so overwhelmed by all the plurality of gods texts spoken positively about. You know, and when I say that, it's like true gods, seemingly, not just idols. Yet he seemed to have like uh, realized Maybe there is something that's plurality of gods and not simply plurality of persons, like, yeah, after all. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I would also argue, like, uh, the Bible is pretty consistent with, like, the Hardy and theology on many scores. Like, God did not create a nothing which itself is significant, it has many implications. But also that there is a plurality of true gods in the midst of the one true God, um, and many other things as well, like, um, God having a three dimensional form and stuff like that by nature. And that has logical ramifications as well. And I think Joseph. Um, around, like, say, scripture, modern revelation, his own thoughts, you know, because he was a student of Hebrew as well, and, like, he kind of realized he yeah. had been proactive in his learning as well. Um, once kind of take all these things into cons uh, consideration, I think, like, um, he did produce through his revelations and through his more mature understandings and sermons, like the Kingful of Discourse, um, a really beautiful, compelling theology. Um, I don't believe it was the... I believe that there is, like, growth and sometimes inconsistencies. Like, uh, I don't think he can do a very good job of trying to claim Lecture in Fate 5 is consistent with what we have later, but at the same time, like, what yeah. he left us was a very beautiful, compelling theology, and very consistent mm. as well. Yeah, you can never understand it. Further light knowledge and revelation and line upon line, greater uh, understanding of just the nature of God. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a much more uh, compelling and inconsistent historically speaking theology than many critics believe it to be, but what Joseph left us with uh, is a very consistent, coherent, and really compelling theology. 
about like the nature of man, the nature of Christ. Uh, one thing I love is like, um, especially when I've been doing studies and seeing Unitarianism historically in modern times as well, it's like, um, usually the debate is like you result with either a very high Christology and a very low view man and a very low anthropology, or vice versa. But for us, we can actually have both a high Christology and a high view of man, even after a fall. So we can actually have both a high Christology and a high anthropology. So we have the best of both worlds without having to engage in the gymnastics. The other groups believing when it comes to say subordination of the father, subordination of the son of the father, or at the same time the pre-existence of Jesus. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's a really good. Um, we're, we're in a much better position than even. So we can than, harmonize. We can almost have both. Yeah, we, we can have both. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Right, well, it's been a really good uh, discussion and interview looking at Command C God and looking through all the texts. So uh, thanks so much for, for doing this, Robert. Thanks, everyone, for, you know, watching uh, this interview. If you've enjoyed it, you know, like, uh, share, and subscribe. Go check out Robert's uh, YouTube channel, Scriptural Mormonism, um, and his blog as well. I'll put the link in the description. Um, subscribe to his channel. Check out the work he's doing. Check out his blog. Um you have a PayPal as well, don't you? That they could uh, yeah, I have a PayPal as well. You buy it. Yeah, I'll put the link in the description as well. And if you enjoy this, just like, share, and subscribe to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph. And if you care to donate to me, you can to my PayPal, stephen.murphy1996 at outlook.com. And we'll probably do another video very soon on the First Vision, where we look at other aspects. So that'll be coming your way. Okay. Yeah, that, that would be a uh, fun. Um... That would be a fun discussion. So hopefully we can do that um, either before or just after I um, leave for America. Yes, yeah. Try to get that sorted. Good luck with all that anyway. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. -bye.